Darren Alf here from BicycleTouringPro.com and I am in Umeå, Sweden. I just arrived last night after a long flight from the United States and now I am staying at my friend Mats's house. He lives here in town and he's letting me stay for the first couple nights. Um, and today my goal is to put my bicycle together. This is my bicycle that you see behind me here. And down here is my, the rest of my gear basically, my camping gear, clothing, toiletries, all of that kind of stuff. So today the goal is to put my bicycle together and to prepare for the long journey north to North Cape, Norway. I've been bicycle touring around the world for the last 17 years and over that time I've had a number of different bicycles. Those of you who've been following me for say the last five years or so know that I have been riding a Comotion Cycles Pangea touring bicycle since 2012. It's 2017 now and I have a brand new touring bicycle that I'm going to be using this year. It's again made by the same company, Comotion Cycles. They're located in Oregon in the United States. It's an American made bicycle. It's kind of custom made for me as you'll see in a moment. Um, but this is the first time that I have ever actually even seen the bicycle myself. Comotion sent it to me packed in a case like this because they knew that I was going to be flying to Sweden. So I am opening the bike right now for the very first time. I've never seen the bike. I've never ridden the bike. Um, but I think it's going to be awesome based off of what I'm looking at right now. Check that out. So this is probably one of the most interesting parts about assembling my bicycle is the fact that my bike frame has been split in half so that I can fit it inside this travel case. And it's split in half with the use of s, &S couplers, which are these silver things that you see here and here. And basically, they are joints that allow me to put my bicycle together. Oh yeah, look at how nice that looks. Red, white, and black, custom for the Bicycle Touring Pro. So the two joints basically just go together like this, right? And then you simply uh, fasten them in place by twisting this here. And then there's a wrench here, which you use to tighten the s, &S couplers once you have them in position. Darren Alf from BicycleTouringPro.com. Today I am 
Umeå, Sweden. Today is the first day of my bike tour, 2017 summertime bike tour. I'm gonna ride my bike here from Umeå, Sweden up to North Cap, Norway. Um, it's gonna take me about 25 days round trip or so. And today is the very first day. Um, I'm right in the center of Umeå, Sweden right now on a brand new Co-Motion Cycle Siskiyou Touring Bicycle. So this bike is brand new to me today. Um, the goal is to ride kind of northwest today for as far as I can go, basically. Not too far. Um, yeah, 50 to 70 kilometers maybe is all I'll do today, but that's the plan. cycled 60 kilometers now, so I'm looking for a place to uh, camp for the night. All right, so this is gonna be my campsite for tonight. Uh, cycled about 65 kilometers today. It's a good day, good first day, I think. First day with my new Comotion Cycle Siskiyou Touring Bicycle with pinion, with a pinion gearbox. Sorry, out of breath. And um, yeah, it worked great, so. Um, my bike is definitely heavy. I got a lot of food on there, so I need to eat a lot tonight. I'm really tired. I think I'm still kind of suffering from jet lag, but uh, I'm going to set up my tent right here to my left. It's hard to see on camera, but here to my left is a river. So I'm going to set up my tent facing this direction so that I can sit in my tent and see the river. Pretty cool spot to camp on my first night in Sweden. So I'm just sitting in the tent now. I should take my helmet off. Um, I'm so tired. I'm just gonna lay down and like take like a 30 minute nap, I think. It's about 5.30 in the afternoon right now. So um, if I sleep for like a half hour, an hour, wake up, it doesn't get dark until like 10.30, 11 o'clock at night here. So um, I'll still have plenty of daylight. And then I, when I wake up, I can make some food um, and maybe use my camp stove. So, sleep time. Yeah. Bird flying over. Ho, ho, ho. Okay. <sighs> yeah. oh, yes. One of the best things about Sweden, I think, like camping in the forest here, is that the ground, if you find the right spot, of course, but there are lots of good spots, um, is like super mossy. 
and so it's just like really soft like you don't even need an air mattress practically so I'm on a super mossy spot at the moment with my air mattress underneath that as well so it's pretty darn comfortable I've said this before but like I think it's worth saying again like this part of bicycle terrain is my favorite at the end of the day you set up your tent you climb inside and you're just like ah best part ever <laughs> Good morning, it's day two of my bike tour here in Sweden. I had a good night's rest last night. I arrived here in camp last night at like 6, 6.30 p.m. and I immediately fell asleep. I was so, so tired. I think I'm still recovering from jet lag. I then woke up at about 11 p.m. at night and was awake from then until about 3 a.m. this morning. Um, and then I fell back asleep and slept until about 6 a.m. Right now, I'm not exactly sure what time it is. I would guess it's about 7.30 in the morning. But I've packed up my tent. Um, the sun is out today, the sky is clear. It is quite chilly, I'm wearing a jacket. Um, and I might need to put another jacket on if I'm in the shade. Um, but uh, yeah, it's gonna be a good day. I'm feeling so much better than I was yesterday. Yesterday I was just so focused on riding because I was not feeling well and it was my first day on the road and I had a new bike. The new bike um, that I'm riding by the way is a Comotion Cycles Siskiyou Touring Bicycle. Totally brand new to me. It's got a pinion gearbox on it down here. So there is no chain and derailleur and all that sort of thing. It's got all of the gears are built inside of the frame of the bike. And then there's a carbon belt drive, uh, carbon belt that yeah, it acts basically as the chain. There are no gears in the back of the bicycle. So anyways, day two on the bike here today. Uh, should be a good one. Here we go. here getting kind of bumpy testing out the new bike on the bumps <laughs> check this out there's just a, a chair on the side of the road see this is the dirt road I'm cycling down right now and over here <laughs> it's just a little chair so you can sit here ah Take in the view. <laughs> nice. Dude, this chair is comfortable, actually. Uh, I can sit here like all day. This is just awesome.
So last year, I cycled down this road, this exact same road that I've been cycling on for the last two days. Um, and it's kind of fun to go back down this road again a year later um, because I'm recognizing all these spots that I stopped and visited uh, a year ago. And this is one of the coolest spots that I visited last year. I'm going to walk down here. Um, hello. But there is this like little, I don't know what you want to call it, shelter here with a fire pit and a picnic table with the river view. And this is what I think is like so cool about Sweden is the fact that they even have something like this. Because I think um, in so many places, something like this is just like they're encouraging you to come out here, sit here and have a fire for no cost and I just think that's amazing the water level right now is so high um, when I was here last summer it was not this high at all it's absolutely crazy So I've cycled 90 kilometers now for the day and I'm gonna I'm gonna call it. I'm done. I hit the wall. I'm pooped. Whatever. Oh gosh. So I'm looking for a place to camp now. Um, it's a little bushy around here. The bushes are high, which is not so great for camping. Pushing the bike back through the road, off of the road. So anyways. I'm gonna find a place to stop here any moment. Today was a good day. I cycled like 91, 92 kilometers, something like that. But my butt is so sore. Um, I have a brand new saddle on this bike and the saddle that I had before this was the exact same model. Um, this is just the newer version of the same saddle. And I love that saddle, the one I had. This one, however, is brand new and it's not broken in yet and oh my butt just hurts so bad so hopefully that will go away in a few days or something oh man it's not good uh, anyways i'm gonna set up my tent now and uh, get some food I'm hungry all right The nights are never long enough on my bike tours, I swear. Uh, it's morning already, it's time to pack up my tent and get on the road. Um, today I'm gonna cycle as far as I can before I fall asleep, basically. So if I get 90 kilometers or something like that, that would be great. Uh, man, I'm such a lazy head. Okay, gotta get out of camp, gotta get out of bed, I can't even talk. Um, <laughs> pack up my bike 
and hit the road. Here we go. Once again, this is the road that I cycled down last summer, so I'm still backtracking and I'm familiar with where I am for the next 22 kilometers in Telmalo, and after that, it'll all be new to me. So that'll be cool. In Malo, I'm gonna stock up at the supermarket and get in some food, water, and uh, take a break. So 22 more kilometers. Check this out, they have a Donald Trump sign here in front of their house with a fake Donald Trump. <laughs> Make a roll the great again. That's funny. That was pretty funny. <laughs> Make Roca great again. I'm guessing this is Roca? I don't know. Roca County. Sweden. It's not too late. I just stopped here on the side of the road. There's my bike behind me. Oh, jeez. Um, I'm gonna put my snow pants on. It is so cold right now. The temperature just dropped like crazy. So I'm just uh, walking over here off the road. There's a little boat. Check this out. Little boat, lake behind me. Just gonna change my pants. Oh, it's so cold. No, I can't believe it. These pants feel so good though. Damn, they feel good. I might not be taking them off for the rest of this trip. We'll see. I've only got about seven more kilometers until Malo. Gonna get food and water there. So that was a nice little town, Malu, Sweden. I'm leaving town now and heading north. Um, it's really nice out when the sun is out and the air is still. But as soon as the wind blows, or you get in the shade, or both the shade and the wind, that's when it becomes really, really cool. Check out that lake behind me. It's huge. 
wind is whipping off of it like crazy. It's still snowing just a little bit, like just little flakes here and there, but definitely snowing. This area I'm going through has like lakes all over the place. There's one right behind me here. Ugh, I can't turn my hand enough. There it is. Check it out, the snow is coming down right now. Woo <laughs> it's a wild day here in Sweden. I just pulled over here because I'm tired <laughs> and I want a break, but also because back there in town, I bought some cookies <laughs> and these are the best cookies I found in Sweden. I don't know what these are exactly. I'm gonna see if you can see that. But you buy these at the Ica supermarket and they have some kind of white chocolate with a berry in there and they are so freaking good. <laughs> I'm sure they're not good for you, but oh yeah. <laughs> after 4 p.m. right now I've gone 82 kilometers for the day I want to do another 10 or so the sky has suddenly gone dark it looks like it's gonna dump snow rain I don't know what any moment I really want to go 10 kilometers further though so I'm just gonna keep going and hope that I don't get hit too hard it is snowing again this is about the tenth time today that it's snowed on me. It just snows for a little bit and then the sun comes out. It snows for a little bit and then the sun comes out. But this is by far the worst, the worst of it today. The ground is a little saturated. The sky is black. You, I don't think you can even tell on camera how black it is right now. It feels like 11 o'clock at night. It is really weird. It's really coming down now. Uh, okay, I just pulled off the main road and my face is frozen. Um, it, it was dumping a second ago and the wind was blowing me. I can't talk, my face is frozen. Blowing me sideways across the road. Okay, I've gone 95.2 kilometers. So I was trying to make it to 100 but I'm not gonna do it. It's 
the storm is like really bad right now so I just want to set up my tent and climb inside inside I can't talk okay up this way now It's snowing again. Oh dear. I think tonight it's probably gonna snow. I think like all night long. Anyways, um, let's take a look at the stats for today. Here we are. Oop, come on, focus. Okay, total distance today was 95.7 kilometers. Maximum speed, 40.7. Average speed, 15.4. Total time on the bike, six hours and 13 minutes. And my, whoops, total distance for this whole trip is 251 kilometers. Not bad for three days. Oh man, look at it going. All right, it's coming down right now. Um, it's about six o'clock at night. And yesterday, last night, I got into camp about the same time, set up my tent, laid down in the tent and fell asleep and I didn't wake up until four o'clock this morning. I was so tired. I'm pretty tired right now too, so um, I don't wanna go to bed today, however, without skipping dinner like I did yesterday. So I'm gonna make some pasta um, really quick on my camp stove and then I'm gonna crash. <laughs> so I've got my dinner cooking here. Uh, it's just water at the moment, um, but the camp stove is on, and I got some pasta and pasta sauce. So I'll cook the pasta, and then when that's done, I'll just cook the sauce in the lid really quickly and mix it all together, and that's my meal. It just keeps snowing, like it just comes down for a minute, like five minutes, and then it stops. And then it comes down again, and it stops. And then that just process just keeps repeating itself all day long. I'd say about 40% of today was in the snow. <laughs> Can you see it out? I'm cooking it. Whoa. <laughs> My breath. It's really cold. Oh man, this is so cool. Alright, time to try my pasta dinner. I'm so excited about this. It's so cold. There. Look at my bag. Look at my bag right here. Covered in snow. Um. <laughs> Pasta maybe could have been cooked a little bit more. <laughs> I was trying to save my fuel. Um, but no, it's fine. It's totally fine. So, Bon appetit, as they say in Sweden. <laughs> I don't know what they say in Sweden, actually. I just woke up. I don't know what time it is. It's like 3 a.m., I think. And look outside. Can you believe that? Oh man. There's the bike. <laughs> wow. 
lots of snow out here. Oh man, I'm gonna go back to sleep. Yeah. just huddled up inside my tent. It was very warm actually, but it's been snowing on and off all morning and all night long. Um, the, the snow on the ground has essentially melted, which is nice, but it is still snowing at this very moment. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, just finishing up, packing up my bike, and then I'm gonna head 10 kilometers into town. I had planned on going to the library today, but the library in this town doesn't open until 4 p.m and I don't want to wait around for six hours just for the library to open. So I'm going to go into town, try to find somewhere to charge my camera batteries, get some food, and then continue up the road. You want to know something a little scary about being out here in the forests of Sweden? Um, is that every once in a while as I'm just walking along or whatever, I will see something like that. Do you see that straight down the trail? It's like a big brown thing. It looks like a bear to me, doesn't it? From in the distance? Of course, as you get closer, you see, oh no, it's just a fallen tree or something. But there's a lot of these scattered throughout the forest and it can be a little scary sometimes. So just as I was leaving camp uh, and about to get back onto the road, I spotted this street light, which is out here in the middle of nowhere. And on the street light is this, which if it works, I'm just gonna camp right here for the next couple hours. Um, I could have been charging my stuff all night long, damn it. I'm gonna plug it in and see if it works. Okay, here's my little tester. This is a universal like power adapter basically. So I can plug in all my electronics and if the light turns on, it works. Yes! Okay, I'm parking myself right here. I am so happy about this find. I just wish I had found it last night so I could have charged everything while I was sleeping. Um, check it out, so I have one camera battery for my bigger camera here. I have a smaller camera battery charging here, and then I have my GoPro plugging in to the USB. So all three devices are charging right now. I don't know how long it's gonna take to charge these. I really need to charge like at least two camera batteries. So it might take two hours of me just sitting here and waiting, but I'm willing to do that because this is how I make my movies, which I then share with you guys. I gotta sit here for two hours charging these batteries in the middle of Sweden in the snow just so I can bring you these clips. I hope you appreciate it. So, while I'm sitting here just charging these electronics or waiting for them to charge, I thought I would talk about what's going on right now. <laughs> um, one of the things that has happened over the last couple days, this is day four of my bike tour in Sweden if you're just joining, but um, two days ago, I didn't mention it, but two days ago I got an email from my mom as I was laying in my tent at night saying that my uh, aunt had just died. And um, the following day, yesterday, I got an email from my mom saying that my grandmother, my 101 year old grandmother, who I actually lived with for a short time, um, had also died. Um, I wasn't ready to talk about it at the time, I guess, so I'm talking about it now. But it's not fun to be out here all by yourself in a foreign country 
with no one to talk to and to get news like that. Uh, it sucks, you know? And so, anyways, I don't really, like, there's, I'm not as impacted by it, I guess, as much as I thought I might be. Um, because my grandma was 101 years old and I knew it was coming, we all did. Um, but still, I just feel really, really sad. Um, and with my own health scare uh, in the last year and a half or so, I had cancer and I'm just like super scared about dying now. So having my grandma die and having my aunt die within a day of each other uh, has basically taken an emotional toll on me to a certain extent out here on the road. Um, and this isn't the first time that something like this has happened to me on my travels. Um, when I was in South Africa a couple years ago, something bad happened. Uh, it doesn't matter what it was. It wasn't, honestly, it wasn't as life-altering as my grandmother dying, but um, it, it felt like something big to me at the time. And it really impacted the overall like well-being of my bike tour. I was not doing well emotionally after that incident. Um, it's weird how something on the other side of the planet can affect you so much. Um, but yeah, I got some bad news from home and really after that moment when I was in South Africa, I just wanted to come home. That's it. Like my trip was essentially over. Um, so it sucks that here I am at the very beginning of this trip receiving such horrible news from home. Um, but in all honesty, there's nothing else I can do. Um, I'm not going to fly home or anything like that. Uh, I'm just going to keep on going, you know, keep on living. So uh, here we are, just waiting for my camera batteries <laughs> to charge, I guess. Anyways, just wanted to tell you what was going on. Um, sometimes I think people mistake the fact that, you know, bike touring is like very, very simple. Like you're riding a bike, that's it. You're sleeping in the forest, you eat, you sleep, and you ride. Um, but there is actually more going on. It's just going on up here. And sometimes that doesn't come across when you're watching the videos. So that's all I wanted to say. Having to just stand here in the snow sucks. I'm doing push-ups and like jumping jacks. Look at the snow coming down behind me. All right. So I've been at this uh, street lamp for the past several hours and it's time to go. It is snowing like crazy right now. Um, 10 kilometers into town, I'm gonna get some food and then continue up the road as far as I can. Um, if I make it 40 kilometers today, I'll be fine with that. Um, if I make it further, that's awesome. But here we go. Okay, so I'm leaving the street lamp or street light and uh, making my way back onto the main highway. It is snowing pretty darn good right now. I have my snow pants on um, and I have 10 kilometers to go until I get into town. Uh, I'm gonna get some food and water there and then continue on down the road as far as I possibly can tonight. So it's 7 p.m. at night right now, and I've been inside the library here um, charging my batteries again and just downloading podcasts, new podcasts to listen to, and staying warm mainly. I just did not want to ride it. It is so cold. I've gone 14 kilometers today, <laughs> and it's 7 p.m. Oh man. Um, I just. Uh, over here is the supermarket and I just went over there and refill, refilled uh, my uh, 
water bottles and got food for dinner and tomorrow. So um, I'm gonna pack up now, jump on the bike and continue down the road. I'm not going very far today. We'll see if I go 10 more kilometers, maybe, we'll see. So it's a little after 7 p.m. I am just leaving town now. Um, I just saw three moose off to my left hand side. Didn't get them on camera, but uh, they're there. So um, car traffic is basically non-existent at this point. Um, I'm just gonna continue riding until I get tired and then find a place to sleep. The great thing about Sweden is there's no uh, shortage of places to sleep. You just pull off practically anywhere. Oh, today has been quite the day. <laughs> So, last night I cooked pasta on this little camp stove. Tonight it's already really late, I just don't feel like cooking. Um, but I am going to boil some water really quick, it's snowing right now. And um, I bought some hot chocolate at the supermarket and I'm going to try it out because hot chocolate right now in the snow sounds really good, much better than pasta in my mind at least. So I have cold veggie sandwiches that I'm going to make and then the hot chocolate. I'm camped not too far from the road. I can see the cars going past and you can probably hear them in the background. Um, hot chocolate is going. I 
made about three three quarters of a liter of water so quite a bit it's kind of diluted hot chocolate but it's the warmth I want not necessarily the quality of the drink I guess okay this is it not bad I should have cooked the water a little bit longer but it's you know, I, I, right now I want the water to be like piping hot. But I'm also trying to save my camp stove so I'm not using all the fuel. It's warm though, it's good. I mean, it's beyond warm. But... Good morning. So uh, last night was very, very cold. The coldest night of the trip thus far. I had pretty much all of my clothes on and I could still feel chills getting through to me. It looks like it's gonna be another cold day today. The sun is out, which is nice. And if the wind would stop blowing, it would be spectacular. It's just the wind is so cold. So um, I'm packing up camp now and I've got my face mask on for the first time in, um, the, this entire trip. I've never used this face mask before. I don't know if I like it, but I'm gonna ride in it today because it is chilly. Um, here we go. <laughs> First bike tourist I've seen. Me too. Really? <laughs> Hi. Hi. So that was cool. I ran into another bicycle tourist. Her name was Monica. I didn't want to stick the camera right in her face, so I turned it off. Um, but uh, she's riding basically from like northern Sweden down to Gothenburg, Sweden, which is kind of near Oslo, Norway. So um, she said it was her first bike tour ever and she said she's coming from the north going south, I'm going south going north. Um, but she said there was some really bad snow up here and as she cycled away she said, don't freeze your ass off. That was her piece, last parting word. Uh, piece of advice. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's really cold out here. Um, I'm at a little, I don't know, there's a toilet right there. Ooh, a toilet. Um, but the sign here is basically like showing where I am. So, this is a map of Sweden, and that red dot is me. So, I'm kind of aiming to go up here somewhere. Um, but she is going like down here, I think, or I don't know where Goldenberg is exactly. But um, also on the sign, they're talking about uh, Allemansreiten, which is basically the one of the cool things about Sweden and Norway and Finland is the right that 
they give you to go camping and be out in nature, um, which is really, really cool, which allows me to be in all these cool camping spots that you see me in. So, anyways, just wanted to show that to you. I'm just taking a break. Um, I think I've gone about 40 kilometers thus far today. And if I do another 20 or 30, that'd be great, so. Going up a good sized hill here. My butt feels a little bit better today. Uh, I'm still tired though. And I'm still going into a headwind. I'm just taking a break here on the side of the road, eating some trail mix. This stuff is pretty good. I'm also setting myself up so I can listen to a podcast while I ride. Not a lot going on today. Today's kind of boring. Scenery is just, wind is in my face. Yeah. I got like a hundred kilometers until Jokmuk, Sweden. So I'll get there tomorrow, hopefully. So it is 5 p.m. at night. I've gone a little over 70 kilometers today. It's been really windy, lots of headwind. Um, but uh, it's time to look for camp, I think. So I'm looking for a place to sleep near water. I need water. Um, that's the main thing I'm looking for. I've said it many times, I know I would change my ways, I know for sure When all the crows decide to meet They settle down beneath my feet I've got it right and I got it wrong But I learned my lesson Sit here with me by the fire And let it go for a little while So be here as the night starts falling Let my fingers walk over you Gotta get a video of you guys here. Other bike tourists. <laughs> From Switzerland. Cool. And Yeah, the, the bike 
splits apart in half. Sure. Oh. And then I can fit it. Really yeah, fit it in a suitcase. So okay. I flew it here for free on the airplane. Don't okay. have to. Don't okay. have to pay extra. Okay. Yeah. Here's the sign to Yokmok and Dalabare, my next two stops. Look at that lake over there. It's almost completely frozen over. Hey. Hi. How did I get ahead of you? <laughs> when did you pass us? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't see you. <laughs> you're, 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 uh, Big machine, uh, wood um, cutting machine, you know? Oh, okay. On the right side. Yeah. And the young glorious wind. Won't you be my guy and let me follow? Can I hold your hand for all time's sake? And all this time you waited for me. Little did we. You made it. Uh, <laughs> I had. I was running out of energy. Uh, I had to eat uh, chocolate and uh, I had to have a drink. Yeah, no, I understand. Because uh, this, um, the climbing of this uh, steep road was too much for me. Uh, to the one back then, you know? I usually stop every five minutes. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's right. It's right. So I just had lunch with Theo and Joseph. Um, they paid for my lunch, which was really, really nice. And then I just stocked up on food and water here at the supermarket, the Ika supermarket. And now I'm gonna cycle a short distance out of town and find a place to camp. And over here is a lake. So I have a view of a lake and my own fire pit. So uh, 
before I set up camp here, let me tell you what's going on with me. Um, I hurt my shin really bad yesterday and I knew it was going to be bad the moment it happened. Um, but I didn't think it was going to be this bad. Um, I think my shin has swelled up to like four times what it was yesterday. And oh, I, it's going to be hard to see, but I don't know if you can even tell on camera, to be honest. But, oh, okay. It, you can kind of see here. But yeah, like, okay, that's my normal shin. And then, whoop, <laughs> it just swells up completely. Um, basically from like, it's swollen all the way down here. But yeah, down by my ankle all the way up to about... Ooh, up to over here on the right hand side. So all of that is swollen really, really bad. It feels like the muscle is about to come out of my skin. It's so tight. And I was dying today on the bike. Uh, I don't know if you could tell, but I was dying. So anyways, um, it's really bad. Like, like really bad. Uh, I can barely move my right leg. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to stay here in Yukmuk, Sweden for the night um, and tomorrow night at, at the very least, maybe even longer um, until this gets better. Because I, I honestly think if I keep cycling on this, it's just going to get worse and worse. I'm really going to hurt myself. So um, I'm going to set up camp and I'm going to go look for some snow and I'm going to try to ice my, my uh, shin. That's basically it. Um, and I'll probably be doing that for the next day or two, um, if not longer. So that's the plan here in Yukmuk, Sweden. Yukmuk, happy to be here. The town was really cool. Um, we had a good lunch, like that place was really nice. Um, I ordered a pizza and a Sprite and the pizza came with a salad and coffee and cookie and yeah, all of it was really, really good. And it was about one, 110 uh, Swedish Krona, which is a little over, I think it's like 12, 13 dollars, 13 US dollars, so not too bad actually. Um, maybe 15, I'm not sure. Anyways, that's what's going on here in Yukmuk. I'm walking around right now trying to find some snow that I can put on my leg, but I can't find any snow around here. It's ironic that the day that I cross above the Arctic Circle is the warmest day, ow, oh, I tripped, warmest day on the entire bike tour thus far, and there's no snow anywhere. Whereas the last couple days, there's been snow all over the place. My camp last night, had snow right next to it. So, gosh, I think what I'm gonna do is there's that lake nearby. I'm gonna see if I can, at the very least, just dunk my leg in there for a few minutes. Um, Cause the water is probably freezing cold. So yeah, it's the best I can do, I guess, out here. Oh, dear. I got, I have no strength. I can't pull up. I can't pull up. Oh dear. Oh shit. That hurts. That hurts. Oh. Okay. I think you can see the swelling now. Oh. Look at what. Oh, those are nasty. Ow! I have like no strength in my leg right now. Oh. 
I hurt myself bad. I am cooking dinner on the camp stove here. Can you see that? And I'm just hanging out in the tent. I'm being lazy with the camera work today. Just trying to rest. So just hanging out inside, listening to a podcast, cooking some pasta. Good morning, Darren Alf here from BicycleTouringPro.com. I'm in the forest outside of Jukmuk, Sweden today, and I'm going to cycle from here to the nearby town of Galavare, which is about 95 kilometers away. food it's about I don't know what time it is actually I think it's about 5:30 at night I want to get some food and then cycle out of town I don't want to speak too soon or anything but the wind right now is kind of at my back it's like the best it's been for this entire trip and I'm just flying up in the 20k plus per per hour here so yeah I'm, I'm zipping along really nice um, what time is it I'm trying to look it is oh it's only 5:30. I thought it was later than that it's only 5:30, so I'm gonna cycle for like another hour or two and see how far I can get and then make camp. Climbing a pretty big hill here. Big for Sweden at least. It's got me out of breath. I'm hot. Took my gloves off. So it's about 6.42 p.m. right now. Um, I've gone well over 100 kilometers today. Um, I'm probably gonna cycle for about another 20 minutes or so and then find a place to camp. I don't know if you can see, but all around me there's snow on the ground. Just about, I don't know, five meters back from the road. Quite a bit of snow on both sides. Going up a hill now, out of breath. Must put the camera away, okay.
So today was an interesting day. I covered about, I think, 132 kilometers. Um, and yeah, I am pretty far north. I'm getting up there. Um, it's starting to rain, so I'm gonna make this quick. Back when I was in Galavari, I ran into this guy and he was telling me that he moved here to Sweden from Holland. And when he moved up here, he bought a house. Um, he's, he's married and has kids. And just a short distance down the road from his house was this like old abandoned school building. And he asked like, I guess he inquired into like who, who owns that place and what are they doing with it? And apparently the city owned the place and they weren't doing anything with it. So he said, can I buy the place? And they sold it to him for one crown, which is like, I don't know, 15 cents or something like that, something ridiculous. And so he has this giant school building now that he owns outright and he's fixing it up and he's turning it into like a community center for his village. He lives in like a remote part of Sweden. There's not a lot of people around, um, which is probably why the building was abandoned in the first place. But anyway, so he said he's, yeah, putting ping pong tables in there, building the fire pit and I don't know what else, making some apartments or something where people can stay. I just thought that was really cool. Hello, Darren Alf here from BicycleTouringPro.com. It's about 11 a.m. and I am 100 kilometers or so north of the Arctic Circle in northern Sweden. I've just spent the night camping in my tent here. See all my stuff. Um, it's 11 a.m. because all morning it's been raining outside. And one of my strategies for beating the rain is to not go into it. Um, a lot of people will wake up regardless of whether it's raining or not and just go out and get wet. And I don't like to do that. I like to wait until the rain stops and then go. Because oftentimes, especially in the early morning, um, it will rain and it will stop sometime around 10 or so in the morning. And that's exactly the case today. So um, I just waited in my tent until the rain stopped, which it has, I believe. And uh, I checked Google and it says no more rain for the rest of the day, hopefully. Um, so I'm gonna pack up tent now, pack up my tent, pack up my bike, change my clothes, the camera's fogging up, and get ready to go. I wanna cycle about 80 kilometers or so maybe further if I can, um, but that's the plan for today. A common question that I receive um, is, do you ever pack up your tent when it's wet after it's rained or something like that? And the answer is yes, all the time, actually. Um, the second part of that answer, however, is that as soon as I have the opportunity, I'm drying the thing out. So if the sun comes out today, it's very possible that I might stop for half an hour and just open up my tent and let it dry. If not, it looks pretty overcast today. I don't think the sun's gonna come out. Um, I just set the tent up again tonight um, and hope that it doesn't rain again so that it does maybe in fact dry overnight. So that's the answer to that question is, yes, I pack it wet, but I try to dry it out as soon as I possibly can. like they knew me or something. I don't know what that was about, but here we go. Check out that frozen lake behind me. We left our love with question marks, with broken hearts, I went home my life without you. Something right could be so wrong, carry on. 
So I've been riding this new Comotion Cycle Siskiyou touring bicycle for the last, I don't know how long I've been on the road, eight days or something. Um, and it has a pinion gearbox, which means there is no metal chain or derailleurs on the bike. All the gearing is inside the frame and there's a carbon belt that kind of drives the bicycle forward. And one of the great things is about this bike and the pinion gearbox and all that is that I have not had to clean anything yet. I've basically done no maintenance on my bike since I've been out here. And yesterday my bike got really dirty going through the snow and dirt. And normally I would have had to clean my chain after that. And my chain would probably have been squeaking and stuff today as I rode, as it kind of dried out and got all the sand out of there and everything. But, because I have that Gates carbon belt on there, there's just no maintenance that needs to be done. I, uh, it's clean, yeah. And it's really, really smooth and really, really nice. I'm out of breath, sorry. So it's a little after 5 p.m. I just loaded up on food and water. I got some juice, I got some tomato soup to make tonight, some bread, tortilla chips and salsa, and a cucumber. <laughs> so, yeah, my bike is very heavy at the moment, but I'm gonna have a feast tonight. I'm gonna cycle maybe for another hour or so. It would be nice to cover about 20 or 20 kilometers or so and then I'll call it. So I've done almost 65 kilometers today. And so if I get over 80, that's, that's good. So it's a little after 6 p.m. There is nobody out on the road right now, like nobody. I got the whole world to myself. Um, <laughs> I have gone 78 kilometers thus far today. I'm gonna try to go 12 more and then call it a night. Try to find some place to stay in this vast wilderness. Where will I camp tonight? That is the question. I just crossed the 90 kilometer mark for the day, which means it is my favorite time of day Time to find a place to camp. And there are lots of places, so. Um, I just want to find a place where I don't have to get my feet wet.
so this morning I it rained <laughs> and I packed the tent just wet as you can see um, so the Sun is still out it's shining a little bit now I'm just gonna set the tent up and, and I think it'll be dry by the time I go to bed so um, not a big deal this tent is getting old so tonight for dinner I've got quite a spread let me show you what I what I'm cooking the main dish is this tomato soup that I bought tomato soup we'll see if it's any good then I got bread and butter and this little bit of cucumber that I got to use up I also got some uh, chips tortilla chips and salsa here and what else? And then I bought so this giant thing of fruit juice. I'm not going to drink that all right now, obviously, but um, that's it for dinner tonight. So um, I'm going to cook this on the camp stove. That shouldn't use too much fuel. Just basically got to heat this up. And then what else? Yeah, just going to enjoy eating here for the moment. One of the things that I don't like about bicycle touring is like all of this stuff comes in packaging and you just burn through so much trash and I mean you do it in your normal life too but out here I think I just notice it more um, because after I'm done with this I can't just like dump it in my trash can at home um, I have to carry it around with me until I find a trash can to put it in so I'm just more aware of the fact that like all of this stuff comes in paper or plastic or what or glass and gosh if you if you were to sit down and think about like at the end of your life if you were like presented with a pile of all of the trash that you created during your lifetime it would be sickening I think um, and I'm just one person imagine there's billions of people on the planet all creating their own piles of trash tomato soup is a little bit oranger than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be red, kind of. Got to get every drop out of this box. So last night when I got to camp, I told you the story about this guy that I met back in Galavari, Alavari. Um, and he was telling me that he bought a schoolhouse for one crown, which is like 12 cents or something like that. And the way he was able to do that was, um, he is not from Sweden and he, he moved up here, um, to this part of Northern Sweden from Holland and, uh, excuse me, I'm cooking and talking at the same time, but he moved up here from Holland and saw this old school building and no one was using it and he, and he just looked into who owned it and and that sort of thing and asked if they wanted to sell it and they sold it to him for a crown one crown and the reason I told that story is not only because I think it's interesting but it says something about uh, outsiders like sometimes um, when you're from an area like you tend to think like everyone else in that area like all of the locals here in Sweden saw that old schoolhouse and didn't think anything of it. They just thought, oh, it's an old building and that's the end of it. But he saw that old schoolhouse and thought to himself, hey, here's an opportunity, perhaps. And I just think that's really interesting because... I'm going to start the stove here. Um, because that's like why I travel in the first place. Like. I'm not so interested now in like going to see churches and going to another museum or something like I've been to thousands of those over the years Whoa. and I don't I just think it's interesting that like sometimes it takes an outsider to come in and look at things differently and that's part of why I travel is like I think it's fun to I don't know when you're traveling go into someone else's home and note all of the differences between the way that they live and the way that I live back home or the way that my friends live or family lives or whatever right and to compare and contrast that with you know the way people live all around the world but 
that outsider mentality, I guess, like coming in as an outsider, you have like a piece of gold that you're carrying around with you. Like you are a little gold mine and you don't even realize it um, as an outsider because you view the world differently than everyone else in that part of the world. Um, and that's part of why like so many like big companies and stuff will pay consultants to come in and assess what they're doing and suggest things that they could do differently. It's because the people that are in the business are blind to what is wrong with the business. But somebody who can come in from the outside and who has a different perspective can come in and make some real change. And yeah, so that's why I was telling you the, the story about the schoolhouse yesterday um, and that guy that bought the thing for a crown. It's just because it's it goes back to travel, I think, and um, being an outsider and all of that kind of thing. So I just thought that was really cool. Here we go. not bad I bought this bread days ago I don't know it's kind of like pita bread it doesn't taste good it's just like really dry kind of and uh, yeah I don't want to waste it so <laughs> I'm eating it up tonight so here's where I am today and I've cycled from down here in Umeå, Sweden, up here, and I'm going up to the North Cape in Norway. So I'm about halfway there right now, but I wanted to show you um, some logistical sort of stuff. This brown dot down here, whoops, sorry. This brown dot right there, that's where I was last night, and this is where I am tonight. These green dots are supermarkets that I've pre-programmed into my phone just so that when I pass those areas, I would know that I could get food or water there. If you look at the route that I have for today, going up this direction, and I'm planning to stay in this city here where those dots are, there is nothing along the way. That's a distance of about 80 kilometers. So when I was planning my ride yesterday, I knew that I wanted to get to this point by the evening so that I could refuel with food and water, stock up on food and water here, which is exactly what I did. And then I cycled a short distance um, further beyond that. And um, this distance that I did here was 93, 97 kilometers, something like that. And I wanted to continue a short distance past the supermarket because I knew that I wanted this distance not to be too far. Because that distance here, from here to here, is 105 kilometers. Um, and so I cycled another 25 kilometers or something like that. So now I've only got 80 kilometers to cycle today. So I just wanted today to be a shorter day, which is why I continued to cycle past the supermarket. Anyways, um, from a logistical standpoint, my plan is to cycle to this town. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Refill, um, you know, get food and water here. And there's also a library where, where I plan to um, charge up my batteries. And so my plan tonight is just to get to this town and get some food and water and camp somewhere nearby town. Then in the morning, I'm going to go back to the library. It opens at 8.30 in the morning. Stay there for four hours until it closes at 12.30. And then I will continue cycling across the border into Finland. So that's the border right there, this line kind of going down. And so today is really my last full day of cycling in Sweden. And tomorrow I'll cross into Finland. And this line up here, that's the Finland-Norway border. So the day after that, I will cross the, the border into Norway.
go on the road. It is so warm today. It's really hot today. First day where I'm just wearing my jersey. It's crazy. You see it? He's he's just looking at me. We're just looking at each other. Oh, there he goes. Hey, that was really cool. I saw a fox. My first fox on this trip. What's interesting too is like I saw the fox because I'm going slow and I'm looking around. Cars are passing me while I'm standing here shooting the fox and they're probably wondering what am I pointing to my camera at? They don't see anything because they're going a hundred kilometers an hour. But I saw the fox because I was going slow. That's what's cool about bike touring. You get to see stuff like that. I just looked at my map and realized that there's only five kilometers to the town. So I'm almost there. I didn't even realize it. That's great. I love it when that happens. <laughs> So I found a place here in town to charge up my electronics, just one of these uh, parking lot boxes that are used during the winter time to like keep your engine block warm. So I'm charging two camera batteries and a backup battery on that all at the same time. I'm, I've also got my solar panel here pointed towards the sun, so that is charging one of my uh, batteries as well. I carry two of these with me. These are voltaic. I don't know how big these are actually, but um, I carry two of them. So right now I'm recharging my smartphone with one of them, and the other one is being recharged by the sun as we speak. So uh, lots of charging going on, but all of this takes time. You just gotta sit here and wait. So um, I'm gonna read a book right now 
and that's about it. Just hang out. It doesn't get dark here ever, so I don't have to worry about it getting dark. Um, I've loaded up on food and water for the night. I got enough to get me through the evening, so I'm just going to wait here, charge my batteries, and then when I'm done, go off into the forest and find a place to camp. While I was just sitting here, an owl flew right past, like, three meters away from me, right over the water here. I have never seen an, an owl in the wild that close before. That was so cool, and it, he's still flying around. I saw that bird flying around, but I didn't know it was an owl until it flew right past my face. I wish I had had my camera. Now I'm watching him. I'm going to try to get him on camera if he comes back this way. That was really cool. It's like a white speckled owl. Kind of small, but really neat. That's the owl right there, but he's really far away now. I'm just going to keep watching him and see if he comes back over here. Oh, there he goes. Oh, he just dove down. Just about fell over there. It's hard to believe that just a few days ago I was freezing my ass off and it was snowing and today is so nice. I wore shorts and this jersey all day long and like right now, even at eight o'clock at night, it's really, really comfortable. So anyways, first thing I do usually when I get to camp is just take out all of the clothes that I think I might need to sleep in. So like I sleep in this shirt, I sleep in these warm socks if I need it. Maybe tonight I won't. I sleep in these fleece pants. Yeah. Normally I get out my down jacket and all that kind of stuff, but I don't think I'm gonna do that tonight. So I think that's everything. Then I get my cooking stuff out, which is down here in the bottom. Toiletries. I need this because I'm still nursing my swollen shin. I gotta put some stuff on there. I'm gonna ice it too. There's some snow over there. Put that on my leg tonight. Here is the camp stove. Dun, dun, dun. So tonight I'm gonna make rice and beans with tortillas. And that's about it. I was trying to find salsa and avocado to go with it, but I couldn't find any in this little town, unfortunately. So, rice and beans and tortillas is it for tonight. All right, so I'm in the tent now. There were some mosquitoes outside, so I just wanted to zip myself in here. Um, the mosquitoes are out there, but they don't seem to be bothering me, which is really weird because normally mosquitoes love me. Maybe I haven't eaten any ice cream in a while, so maybe that's why. I'm not sweet enough for them. Um, so it's hard to see, but I, I made beans and rice and I just, I'm mixing them up in this bowl here. And then I'm just going to plop them on some tortillas and that's the whole meal. Uh, like I said, I wanted to get some veggies to mix in here, but I couldn't find any really that were any good. So I'm using the packaging as my plate. And then I'm just going to plop this on. And I wish I had some 
some salsa, avocados, tomato, something like that. Oh well. Definitely not the best burrito I've ever had, but it's not it's not bad either. It's good. Good for camping. Good morning, Darren Alf here from BicycleTurningPro.com. I've been on the road for 11 days or so now here in northern Sweden, and today it's about 8.15 in the morning. I am waking up a little bit earlier than I normally do because I want to go to the library in town and charge all my camera batteries. Um, after that, I will cross the border. It's only one kilometer from here, cross the border into Finland and then I will continue north from there up towards Norway. It'll take me maybe two days to get to Norway. So today is charging batteries and cross into Finland. So I'm leaving town now. I just loaded up on food and water and I was at the library for the last three and a half hours or so. I got one, one and a half batteries charged. I sent out an email to the Bicycle Touring Pro email list. Did some other, you know, responding to comments and messages and stuff like that. And now I am getting on the road. So. I forget the name of this town, Karasjungo or something like that, Sweden. And I have about, oh, 300 meters or so until I get to Finland. Now, Finland uses a different currency. They use the Euro. And here in Sweden, they have the Swedish Krona, so. The currency is about to change as well as the country. Here we go. Cross the bridge. See there's this sign, the Euro sign for Finland. Tourist information. Alright, here we go. Finland. Crossing the water. Oops, it's a nice day. All right, here's the actual border now. Sweden and Finland. I'm gonna slow down and take a picture. Here I am, Sweden and Finland. I'm in Sweden, that is Finland. I'm in Sweden, that is Finland. <laughs> this will be my second time in Finland. The last time I was in Finland was 2014 and I did a 650 kilometer bike ride across the country with my friend Rob. And then I did another shorter bike tour um, after that as well, kind of up in central Finland. So this is my second time in the country and I'm looking forward to being back. And in Finland now. <laughs> So I stopped back there, changed my jersey, got a little food, I probably have some food in my teeth, 
and what else? Uh, that's it, I guess. <laughs> I've only, I've gone 10 kilometers. Um, I'm, I'm only planning to go like 70 kilometers today. So 60 more kilometers to go. And then I'm gonna camp in the next town, basically, or just outside of town. So, that's the plan for today. Reindeer, right there, white reindeer. Dun dun dun, we're having a stare off. Who can stare at each other the longest? I will win. Look away, reindeer, look away. Oh, I win. I am the master of the reindeer staring contest. Check out this river I'm crossing now. Ooh. Nice. stop area here beside the river So far there's no noticeable difference between Sweden and Finland. One of the border crossings that I've done on my bicycle that was like super noticeable of where like the country ended was the border between Turkey and Bulgaria. Like northern Turkey you're cycling through like desert sand and then as soon as you enter Bulgaria there's just trees like right at the border practically. That was pretty dramatic I think. But here. Not so much, not a big difference. Observation deck here. This is cool. Nice little fire pit here, shelter, picnic table, even an axe to chop wood with. <laughs> Out here is the bathroom over there. So what we have here <laughs> is an observation deck to observe Finnish birds. Do you see any birds out there? I see a couple far away. I got about 20 kilometers left in my ride today until I get to town. I'm almost out of water and I'm really tired. I did not sleep well last night. I was worried about waking up early and getting to that library in time. Um, yeah, so tonight I want to go to bed early. Okay, anyways. Oh, my, my shin is still killing me. This is a cool little stop though, huh? What would a trip to Finland be if you didn't stop and chop some wood? <laughs>
just went into the supermarket here. Different supermarkets here in Finland, different prices. Everything's in euros now. All right, got some tomatoes, beans, lettuce, and these cookies that I like so much, <laughs> and water. So I loaded up on food and water for the evening. I want to camp somewhere near town so that if I want to or need to, I can come back to the store in the morning and get more food or water. So I really only want to camp a few kilometers maybe outside of town. Um, we'll see what I can find. Back there in town I ran into a couple traveling on a motorcycle. They're from Germany and they're just cruising around uh, this part of Europe and then going over to the Lofoten Islands in Norway and then going back to Germany and I met another guy who's hitchhiking. Check out this sign here. It says caution reindeers. There's no <laughs> there's no S on the end of reindeers. It's just reindeer. One reindeer or two reindeer. Not two reindeers. Um, but anyways, yeah, another young guy that from Germany as well, southern Germany, Black Forest. He's hitchhiking around Europe. And he said, so far, Finland has been very difficult to hitchhike in. But uh, he says, I got lots of time, and he's got a skateboard with him also. So he, he said, how long will it take you to get to the North Cape on your bike? I said, oh, maybe a week or less. And I said, how long on your skateboard? He's like, ah, oh, a month. <laughs> yeah, so anyways. Another interesting thing that just happened back there is I checked my phone just to look to make sure I was on the right road or whatever and the time had changed. It had jumped an hour ahead. My bike computer says it's 625 and my phone says it's 725. So I'm guessing when I entered Finland I lost an hour. They, they're on a different time zone. So I'm thinking oh it's early it's only 630. But it's actually 7.30. Um, not that it really matters, like the sun never goes that down really. So I could cycle until 1 a.m. if I wanted to. But uh, I'm pretty tired from waking up so early this morning. I just want to get into camp, make some food, and get a good night's sleep. Tomorrow I got another 80 kilometers or so to cycle. So I'm gonna find a place to camp here very, very soon. respectable 80 kilometers. It's pretty good considering I didn't leave that library until like 1 p.m. this afternoon. Okay, so let's check out the stats for today. We got 81 total kilometers, maximum speed 44, average speed almost 18. That's a little over 10 miles an hour, guys, or 11 miles an hour maybe. Um, four hours and 31 total minutes on the bike, and that's about it. So it's my favorite time of the day, time to set up camp. Get my tent set up, cook some food, ice my leg, and call it a night. I got some beans for dinner tonight. I'm gonna make burritos again. Tortillas, rice. Oh yeah. 
So it's almost 9.30 at night. I'm uh, getting ready to go to bed. Um, I'm in Finland now, which is awesome. I talked to my mom last night on the phone and she was asking how I was doing up here. And I said I was really enjoying it, wasn't having any problems, really nice people, really good food. Everything was good, you know? Um, and she was just asking kind of, you know, if I was having any health issues because um, about a year and a half ago I was diagnosed with cancer. And since then I've been having a whole host of problems. I went to Alaska and wasn't feeling well. Um, went to South America and had all kinds of dizziness and fatigue and yeah and it's been basically lasting me for like a year and and I didn't really know what's going on I've seen all my doctors they don't know what's going on with me um, and since I've been here I've been pretty darn good to be honest and I think it has to do mainly with anxiety over having cancer basically um, like when I was in South America I was just super worried because right before well actually before I went to Alaska I had a CT scan and blood tests and all this kind of stuff and on my CT scan they saw some swollen lymph nodes and that's like a major concern when you've had cancer because oftentimes the cancer will spread to the lymph nodes so there were these swollen lymph nodes uh, that they discovered but they basically said we aren't going to do anything about it we're just going to let you go and come back in three months and then we'll check it well during that three month period I went to Alaska and this these swollen lymph nodes was, were on my mind you know so I went to Alaska didn't do so well there then went to South America didn't do well there either then I came back from South America and I had another CT scan had another round of blood tests had another round of doctor visits and after all that was over they basically said you're good we don't see anything no swollen lymph nodes this time your blood looks awesome and I just felt clear <laughs> basically and I think I've been feeling a whole lot better since then just because my mind is now like okay maybe maybe I am okay you know what I mean but for those three months the three months that I was traveling in South America and and Alaska and all that somewhere in the back of my mind I was really worried about these swollen lymph nodes that had shown up on my CT scan so I think um, I don't know what I'm trying to say exactly but like I feel better now and I think it was all just in my head <laughs> And, you know, bike touring is like a largely mental thing, like the, there is a lot of physicality to it, but like it's largely mental, the ability to wake up every morning and be like, okay, I'm going to do this and pack up my tent and go for 12 days or whatever it is now without a shower. Um, that's all physical stuff, but like there's a, a huge mental aspect to bike touring and frankly, I wasn't in the best mental place uh, for my last two bike tours so I'm glad this trip is going a lot better I'm feeling a lot better I just like being out here and that's all I wanted to say so um, thank you guys um, for asking how I've been doing I really appreciate it um, sometimes I don't like that you ask because then it reminds me actually that I had cancer and I try to forget about it. Um, but, um, I appreciate the sentiment. So thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say for today. I am going to basically go to bed. I'm going to put the rain fly on, not because it's about to rain, but because it blocks out the sun. Um, the sun never sets here above the Arctic Circle, so I just want to try to make it appear somewhat like darkness inside my tent so that's what i'm gonna do now um, it was a good day thanks so much for watching guys and i hope to see you out on the road sometime soon good morning darren alf here from bicycletouringpro.com i'm in the forest somewhere in northern finland up above the arctic circle yesterday i crossed from sweden into finland and today i'm gonna cross from finland into norway now, I've been to Norway two times before. The first time I was in Norway, I uh, participated in two back-to-back self-guided bike tours with a company called Active Norway. And I did that with my friend Eric, who had like no bike riding experience at all. 
Then I cycled across from Oslo, Norway to Bergen, Norway with my friend Rob. After that, I did a, another self-guided bike tour, the Fjord Cycling Route Bike Tour um, with my friend Caitlin. And that was also her first bike tour and she really enjoyed it, I think. Um, then I spent two weeks living on an island by myself in Norway. And then I cycled from that island across Norway into Sweden. Um, and then last summer I participated in the Arctic Coast Cycling Tour once again with Active Norway. Um, and I did that with my friend Sophie who also had never been on a bike tour before. And then I did the Lofoten Islands Bike Tour once again with Active Norway. Um, and then I cycled from Bodo, Norway all the way to Umia, Sweden by myself. So I've done quite a bit in Norway but I've never been to this particular part of Norway. I'm going to the North Cape, which is basically like the most northern road that you can drive to in all of Europe. So I should get there in a few days, five days, four days, depending on how fast I cycle. I think I'm about 450 kilometers away right now. So 25 kilometers though is all I have to do today in order to get to Norway. So that's the plan. First step, pack up my tent. So this is the route that I've been following, this westernly route over here. And I'm right now, I'm right here at this orange or brown dot. And so there's the border of Norway and Finland. And then here's the supermarket that I'm kind of aiming for tonight. So yeah, there's me, there's the border, and that's where I'm going today. And then up here, is the North Cape in Nordkap, Norway. So that's where I'm going to be in a few days. But today is just this little segment right here. I'm on the road again here. When I cycle, I do not think about like the end destination practically at all. Um, like right now, I'm just focused on getting to the border of uh, Finland and Norway, sorry. And once I get there, then I'll think about getting to the next supermarket where I can get food and water. I basically don't think about the end destination for more than like a second. When I was in Sweden, I purchased a SIM card for my phone, so I had internet access the whole time I was in Sweden, even when I was out in the forest. Um, now that I'm in Finland and going to Norway, I do not have internet access. I don't have a SIM card for these two countries. So, not only can I not check my email or tell people where I am on Facebook or Instagram, um, I can't tell my mom where I am either, and she's the one that worries about me the most, I think. Uh, so, I, I basically have to find some Wi-Fi in a couple days and just tweet at her or whatever, send her a message saying I'm okay. Because if I, if I go for too long, she gets really worried about me. And I think she's called the cops on me one time before because I didn't call soon enough or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I don't want her to worry about me too much out here.
gonna go in here and get some food and water. So I just stopped at that little gas station slash market slash restaurant and got some french fries. It was a good little, good little stop there. Charged my batteries for about 20 minutes. And now I am on my way. I've got about uh, 12 kilometers to the border of Finland and Norway now. All right, I'm approaching the border of Finland and Norway. It only took me one day to cycle across Finland. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't think there's a border stop or anything, so just cycle right through. Hey. Woo, Norway. There it is. So I'm in Norway now. Check out this frozen lake behind me. Pretty cool. So I'm uh, cycling into town now. Kind of forgot that I was in Norway for a second. There are different supermarkets here and we have a different currency. So I've been to three different countries, Sweden, Finland, and Norway now in the last 28 hours, something like that. So <laughs> anyways, coming into town, I gotta get food, water, and then maybe I'll continue up the road for another 10 or 20 kilometers. Okay. So I just loaded up on food and water. My bike is super heavy right now with all the water I'm carrying. Um, it's a big hill coming out of town. I don't know what town this is. I can't pronounce the name of any of these places I'm going through. Kautokieno or something, maybe. So before this trip I had been having like dizzy spells all throughout South America and stuff and just as I got to camp here I started feeling really dizzy. I feel like I just want to lay down and I don't know what it is. It feels like the whole world is moving. I don't know if it's the wind or the slope of the hill. It's scary. Feels like I'm just barely hanging on to like consciousness. I want to get my tent set up so I can just lay down.
so, gosh, the days go by quickly. I talk to people sometimes who are like planning bike tours and they're like, man, I'm gonna have all this time. I'm gonna like sit by the edge of the river, painting and flying a kite and writing poetry and riding a hundred kilometers each day and then I'll cook my own meals and I'll sit by the campfire and and the reality is the days go by a lot quicker than that even even when you are just kind of biking gosh the days go by quick so I'm in Norway now yay Norway like I said before this is my third time in Norway and I waited a long time to come to Norway because I had heard how expensive it was and it I think it is like the most expensive country in the whole world uh, maybe South Korea or something is a little more expensive but I don't know yeah it's pretty expensive I guess but honestly like when you're traveling in the way that I am on a bicycle it's pretty darn cheap to be honest like the only thing I'm spending money on is food I'm camped out here in the middle of the forest that doesn't cost me anything I'm basically yeah just paying for food and water so even those things are a little elevated um, price wise but not so much that at least for me it's not gonna break the bank you know my main point is just that like I wish more people would come here because I hear a lot of times like oh I want to go to Norway but it's too expensive. Well it is expensive if you stay in like hotels and you go out to restaurants and you do like the typical tourist thing. But that's the great thing about bike touring is like it can be done for super cheap. And I'm guessing that my entire time here in Norway and even this entire bike tour that I'm on right now this month-long bike tour will not ultimately cost me much more I bet it'll cost less than me actually just sitting at home back in the United States and doing absolutely nothing so that's all I wanted to say is like a lot of people think that world travel is expensive even in a you know a place like Norway obviously is going to be a bit more expensive but ultimately it's not as expensive as you think and um, I think at the end of this trip once I finish um, the month-long journey here I will tell you guys how much money I ended up spending on this entire 30-day journey and I bet you'll be surprised that you know here I am in some of the most expensive countries in the whole world Sweden Finland Norway I think you'll be surprised at how little this trip has cost me you know there are a lot of things that I really enjoy about bicycle touring but the the one thing that I've come to really dislike over the years is packing up my tent in the morning I've been bike touring for 17 years now and I've packed up my tent and my bike thousands of times and gosh it just gets old um, when I'm not bike touring, it is so nice to just like leave my stuff wherever it is. Like I don't make my bed, I just crawl out of bed and I, all my stuff is in the same place. I don't have to pack it up. It's so wonderful. Anyways, here we go again. Alright, I'm back on the road now. The road is quiet today. A little hilly. Now that we're in Norway, the terrain is a bit more hilly. So, my goal today is to cover about 80 kilometers or so. If I do more than that, that's great, but... pretty cold today, kind of hilly, and I got a headwind, so today is a little bit harder than yesterday. It definitely is starting to feel like the Arctic here. Hey. <laughs> so 
So just a moment ago, I spotted two bike tourists off on the side of the road and I rode over to say hello to them. Turned the camera off as soon as I got there because I don't like sticking the camera in people's face when they don't know me. But um, they were very, very cold. Like they were sitting there at the picnic table and when I approached, they didn't even turn around like to look at me and I was just like, hey, just wanted to say hi. And they were like, hi. And didn't turn around, like just looked over their shoulder and yeah, I don't know, like, it, I just got a weird vibe from them, so I was just like, okay, I just want to say hi, talk to you later, bye, have a good trip, or whatever. Um, I don't know if that's just, like, I caught them at a bad time, or if that's, like, the couple thing, like, like, I'm alone, so if I see another bike tourist that's alone, like, generally, there's, like, this, oh, man, I, I got someone to talk to, you know what I mean? But when you travel with a couple they kind of just talk to themselves and and cut everyone out and i've seen that over and over and over again as i've traveled the world for the last 17 years like couples are much harder to approach um whereas individuals are much more likely to want to talk to you um also i mean obviously like i could have just caught them at a bad time like they could be you know miserable and cold and arguing with one another and wanting to go home or who knows what and then i approach sorry all of a sudden and i'm like hey guys what's going on i'm in shorts check me out you know and uh and they may have just not been not been too excited by that you know what i mean kind of taking away from their trip or something like that so Anyway, it's just an interesting sort of thing. Um, you don't see many people out here on bicycles, so when you do see them, you kind of think, gosh, they're gonna be excited to see me. As, you know, I'm excited to see them. But that's, that's not always the case. <laughs> that's not always the case. <laughs>
this morning I was kind of, you know, complaining about how <laughs> packing up my tent in the morning is like my least favorite thing to do. Uh, one of the things I dislike about bike touring. But to be honest, setting my camp up at night after a full day of cycling is like one of my favorite things to do. I just look forward to getting into my tent and I don't know, changing into clean clothes and brushing my teeth and eating some food. So yeah, um, while packing up is not my favorite anymore, um, setting up my camp at night certainly is uh, one of the highlights for me. You know, one of the things that I really like about bike touring, like there are a lot of things that I like, like I like being out in nature, I like the physicality of it, I like meeting new people, that sort of a thing. I like just setting up my tent at the end of the day. Um, but there are a number of things that I think, like when I look back on my bike tours, like the things that I remember most are the things that were completely unexpected. And while like looking at nature and waterfalls and historic landmarks and stuff is kind of interesting, it's these unexpected moments, the things that you could never plan for, um, that I remember the most and that have the most lasting impact on me. For example, um, I'm gonna, I'm trying to get my stove out here. I got a bunch of trash. Okay, there's the stove. Um, for example, I was in Albania, I think this was, I don't know, 2009 or 7 or something like that, and I had just entered the country, and, like, whenever you enter a new country, you're kind of always on edge, like, you don't know what's going to happen, what the place is going to be like, and also I knew Albania wasn't, like, the best place in the whole world. So, um, I was a little on edge, and I was coming into Shkodr, Albania. I think it's like the second largest city in Albania. And um, as I was coming into town, there was this like little cobblestone bike path. Red bricks, I remember the red bricks. And anyway, so I go down this bike path, and, and about halfway down the path, um, I see this kid, he's probably seven or eight years old, and he has one leg, and he's wearing a rollerblade on that one leg. And I don't know how he got there or where he came from or anything, but I rode past him and just kind of gave him a look, and he gave me a look like, I'm about to jump on the back of your bicycle. And, and I, he didn't have to say anything, I knew what was going on. And so I slowed down and I let him grab onto the rear rack of my bicycle and I towed this one-legged kid with a rollerblade, I don't know, a couple hundred meters down the bike path and then he let go and waved and that was the end of our interaction. But I just remember that as like one of my best bicycle touring memories and it's like so random and unexpected that I never thought like something like that would happen when I was, you know, when I, when I set out on that adventure. Like, I want to go to Albania and give a ride to a one-legged kid on a rollerblade, you know? Um, I just, there's no way I could have planned for that. So there's lots of things like that in my travels that have just happened unexpectedly that I think are pretty cool. And, and some of those things are, are kind of sad or like depressing, like that kid with the one leg, like I think part of the reason it stands out to me is like I never knew like why does that kid only have one leg? Was he hit by a car? Was he born that way? Did a dog chew it off? You know, what happened exactly? Um, and yeah, there's lots of incidences like that. And I don't know what I'm trying to say. I guess it's just like sometimes those unexpected moments, even when they are kind of sad or, or depressing or, um, yeah, negative, like sometimes those are the things that make the ultimate trip so incredibly ultimate and amazing, right? Anyways, that's all. Okay, tonight I am making 
this package of tomato soup. I don't know if it's going to be any good. I doubt it, but I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> I couldn't find any actual like fresh tomato soup. That doesn't seem to be a thing here. Like in America, we have a whole row of just canned soup that you could buy. Here, no, nothing. Okay. This is a good way to end the day. Another bike tourist. How's it going? Gotta get you on camera here. This big driver? Huh? That was a nice guy. His name was Benedict. He's from Germany and he didn't speak any English. And my German is terrible. So uh, he was saying some things to me I didn't quite understand, but he was asking where the next campground was and things like that. And just telling me about his trip and where he's from in Germany and stuff all in German, so uh, sorry I didn't get any of that on camera. Check this place out, really nice. That's the direction of my heading way off in the distance over there, up into the snow covered mountains. What do you do when I get in Estonia? Tell me who you are and where you're from. I'm uh, Anders from Estonia. And what are you doing? Uh, I am a construction worker. A construction worker, yeah. But you're on a bike trip now. What, what are, where are you going on the trip? Uh, I plan, I started in Estonia. Then I was two days ago as a North Cup. Then I'm going uh, down to the coast side of Bergen, and then Denmark, Denmark, Germany, and a little bit Poland and a little bit. Slovakia, a little bit Ukraine, <laughs> back to home. That's, That's great. Hey, and you said how how long is the total trip that you're thinking of doing? I must uh, go to work the 4th of September. Ah, but you said it's like 8,000 8, kilometers. kilometers. Yeah. 1,000 kilometers less or more, I don't know. Yeah. And what's been the best part of the trip for you thus far? Uh, North Cap. The North Cap? Yes. Yeah, okay. And what part are you looking forward to the most? Um, Bergen, I think. Hmm, Bergen, Norway. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Cool. And any lessons that you've learned along the way? Things you might do differently if you were to do the trip again? Uh, I buy uh, better clothes mm. than what I bought. That they say it's waterproof. Uh, they, they, they are water. Mm, it's like a rain jacket and rain pants or something. Rain everything. Jacket, uh, shoe covers and uh, stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm just going to show your bike here for a second.
All right, so I'm all set up in the campground. It is blazing hot. There's no shade here. Um, check out how I have my bike locked up. So I have the solar panel in the sun and the bike is locked down here basically through the various pole and layers of cloth on my tent. So if anyone were to try to take it, it would, they'd try to take my whole tent with them. So there it is. There's the reception. There's some other bike tourists over here. TPs in the distance. Yeah. So. Now I'm gonna take a shower. I have one of my batteries charging already. I'm gonna plug the other battery in and then go take a shower. I'm charging my camera batteries up here in the bathroom. Right there and right there. All right, so I just found a nice spot here by the river. Um, I'm just gonna sit on the ground and cook myself some dinner. I got some more stuff to make campfire burritos. So um, that's the plan. I just wanted a nice place by the river. Enjoy my food. This is my dinner for tonight. I got tortillas, beans, salsa, tomato, and that's all I got. Today is Sunday, so like all the stores were closed and the only market that was open was like a tiny little gas station sort of market. So they didn't have very much. I was just able to pick up this and the beans and the rest is leftovers. So um, not much of a dinner tonight, but hopefully tomorrow I'll just load up on food in the morning, hit the road, and in two or three days I'll be in the North Cape. So earlier today I was reading some of my YouTube comments and there was a comment on one of my latest videos, a video that I released from my bike tour in Colombia, which I did just a couple months ago, and the guy was saying basically that he didn't like the video, that he wasn't going to watch any more of my videos, and he said he didn't like the video because um, he thought that my bike tour in Colombia was sort of aimless, that he didn't understand where I was going or what I was doing. Um, or why I was trying to get away from people at certain times or why I wasn't trying more of the local foods uh, That sort of a thing and he said that he liked Some of my other videos more um, He referenced some videos that I put out when I was bike touring in, in Portugal and um, Yeah, and so I just thought I would comment on that while I'm thinking about it at the moment because I, I think it's worth mentioning. There's a couple things. One, if you don't like my videos, I don't know if you have to leave a comment and say that you don't like it. You can just not watch it. Two, um, my bike tour in Colombia was kind of aimless and that was on purpose. I was doing that on purpose. I was just kind of letting the wind blow me wherever it wanted to. If I liked an area, I'd stay there for a while. If I didn't, I kept going up the road. Uh, that sort of a thing. So um, that was that was all by design, essentially. Also, like I was trying to get away from people in Colombia um, because there's people everywhere, <laughs> and and I'm just not like a big people person. So like I need to get time to myself. Um, and so that's what I was looking for, I guess. I don't know exactly what you were commenting on in that video, but also I'm a vegetarian and I was having a terrible time finding food that I could eat when I was in Ecuador and Colombia. Um, I should have brought a camp stove and been cooking my own meals because that wouldn't have been a problem. But as far as like going to restaurants and finding vegetarian food, it was almost impossible and I lost a lot of weight um, on that particular bike tour, like over 12 pounds. So, um, I don't know. That's what you're picking up on, I guess, basically in, the, in that one particular video or, or in that particular series of videos, which is my next point. And my next point is that there are different types of bike tours. So my bike tour in Ecuador and Colombia was very different than the bike tour I'm on now. And, which, and this bike tour that I'm on now is very different than the, the videos that you liked from my bike tour in Portugal or wherever you said you liked. 
um, because the Portugal bike tour was a guided bike tour or a self-guided bike tour where I was the whole tour was like organized by a tour company and I was staying in nice hotels and riding with a group every day and eating fancy meals and that sort of a thing and as you can see by watching this video <laughs> that's not the case here right and that wasn't the case in Colombia either so it's interesting to me because this particular person said he liked the Colombia or the Portugal videos but didn't like the Colombia videos and yet other people have said oh man I love these Colombia videos but I don't like those Portugal videos with the guided tours and all of that so you know that's I don't know an ongoing issue that I've had with Bicycle Touring Pro is like some people like a certain type of touring and other people like another type but one of the things that I've been trying to do with Bicycle Touring Pro is to show you that there are different types of bicycle tours and I've been trying to show you that by going on different sorts of trips that's why I've done guided bike tours like the ones I did in Portugal or South Africa or Switzerland or Norway or wherever it's why I've done self-guided trips in Latvia and Estonia and uh, France and all over the place and it's why I do self-supported trips like the one I'm on now um, so I'm trying to show you that there are different types of bicycle tours because I know that certain people excuse me are going to be more attracted to certain types of touring like I'm on this trip now where I'm camped out in the forest and I just had a shower for the first time in two weeks now that's not going to appeal to a certain type of person right and I know that so um, that's why there are these other types of tours where you get to have a shower every day and a fancy meal and all of that so I'm just trying to show you different types of touring um, and I hope that like you know this video of this day was just one day of like thousands of days that I've spent bicycle touring all around the world and each day is kind of different um, some days are really interesting some days are not some days I'm just surrounded by people and other days it's just me out here by myself so um, yeah that's all I wanted to say is like there are different types of bike touring and the different types of touring are going to appeal to different sorts of people um, but I'm just trying to show you all of the different types and in the future after I finish this bike tour I'm going to be showing you some bike packing which is basically just bike touring largely off-road and packing in a different sort of manner um, and I'm going to show you some like van car touring so that you can like drive your van or car to an interesting area then break your bike out do a little circle route around that area come back to your car and then continue on up the road or back home or whatever so um, if you keep watching these videos you will see that um, there are different types of bicycle travel It's about 9 a.m. right now, which is super early for me, but like I'm the last person practically leaving the campsite. God, these people wake up early. I slept so bad in that campsite last night. That was terrible. Um, I have a lot of people that come to me and they say like, I went camping once and it was horrible. And I, I wonder where they went camping because Every time I camp in a campground like that, I sleep horrible too. I can't, I don't enjoy it. It's noisy, there's people around. Everyone wakes up at three in the morning and starts leaving the campsite. Oh, I could not sleep at all last night. People walking past my tent, six inches past my head, driving past at two in the morning, talking, laughing. Oh, couldn't get to sleep. The good thing about staying at that campground was that one, I had internet access, so I was able to download a bunch of new podcasts to listen to, and two, I was able to charge all of my camera batteries, so um, I should be able to document my trip north to the North Cape now. Uh, yesterday, when I pulled into camp, I had no battery left whatsoever, so um, yeah. Mission accomplished, I guess. I didn't get much sleep, but I got my camera batteries charged. The next thing I want to do is go into town 
and try to find some fuel for my camp stove and load up on food for the next two days or so because the area I'm going through for the next 250 kilometers is pretty remote, I think. So, fuel and food. First stop, Rima 1000. Yeah, well, tell me who you are and where you're from and what you're doing. Uh, my name is Tigre. I'm 40 years old and I decided a few years ago to go from north to south. I turned 40 earlier this year, so this is the start of my trip. Third day. Yeah. And where are you going? What What is the trip exactly? Uh, the trip is Norge uh, Polox, from the North Cape to Lindesnes. I haven't figured out the route yet, and <laughs> just take one day by day. Yeah, and so this is your third day on the road? Third day. Yeah, and wh what do you think so far? It's been great. Uh, the weather has been really nice to me. And all the people I meet are great. That's cool. And where are we right now? Uh, Alta, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Alta, <laughs> Norway. Uh, Alta. Yeah. And but where are we right now? We're we're outside the supermarket. <laughs> you just spotted me or something? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Where is? I saw another long distance cyclist, so I stopped. And I met a true legend. <laughs> Living legend. That's so cool. He's treating me to some Norwegian Skolebre. Skolebre. <laughs> yeah. What's it called? Skolebre. 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 And a cappuccino. Thank you very much. All right. Signing off. Here we go. Goodbye. He, he's going south Woo. and I'm going north. Yay. All right. It was great meeting you. Safe to you. All right. See ya. See ya. Bye. Bye. So I'm going into this like mall trying to find some fuel for my camp stove. There. This is what I'm looking for. So I managed to find some Primus fuel propane butane mix at this mall uh, that you see behind me and I have nowhere to store it on my bike right now. My bike is just so loaded down with food but um, anyways I'm going to find a place for it and then continue up the road. Got to get out of town now. I'm always afraid I'm going to drop the camera whenever I'm on a bridge. Don't want to drop the camera. The city of Alta here is a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, Alta, the city, sits on the end of the Alta River, which is a 200 kilometer long river that flows northward um, here basically out into the sea. So I'm leaving Alta and the Alta River, which I was following for the last several days, and heading north now kind of northeast a little bit actually and uh, yeah the North Cape is about 235 kilometers away from here so it's getting really close there's the sign for the North Cap 229 It has definitely gotten a lot hillier here in Norway. Uh, this is like the biggest hill I've gone up on the entire trip. I'm in my second to lowest gear. <laughs> hey. You know you are here? Yep. Uh, from Swiss? Yeah. We saw them uh, three days ago. Hello. <laughs> Hey, I'm Darren. You're the bicycle hey. girl. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Hi. Hello, Hi. Darren. Hi. We thought we were meet you earlier. Oh, really? I'm slow, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Thank 
you. Just press the button? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three. Ooh, okay. One more. Good to, just yeah. for good luck. Okay. Someone's always got their eyes closed or something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. So how is the new bike? Yeah, I like it a lot. Like it's got that pinion gearing system. Yeah, it's good. it's really cool. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> All right. Yeah, it was great meeting you. Yeah, nice meeting you. You too. All right. Good luck. Enjoy the rest of your ride. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy your trip. Send me a picture or something. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ciao. Bye. It's so cool when I run into people who follow me on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or on my website. Um, oftentimes, you know, I'm just sitting at home alone on the computer, uploading this stuff, working on it all, not knowing if it's reaching anyone. And so it's cool to see that there are people out here who not only consume the content, but actually go and do their own bike trips for themselves. That's my goal in the first place, so it's pretty awesome. I think that's the top of the hill there. I think, I hope. <laughs> All of the trees have suddenly disappeared. There's almost no plant life whatsoever. <laughs> Howdy. <laughs> you making me lunch? <laughs> Are you making me lunch? <laughs> <laughs> that was Sven from Frankfurt, Germany. And it looks like there are two other bike tourists up here up the road. There are bike tourists all over the place up here. Hello. How are you? Hi. I just wanted to stop and say hi. Hi. Hey. He's, there's a guy, a German guy up here. He said, there's two ladies behind me or something like that. Oh, well, I hope, did you start? Um, where? Yes. In Umia, Sweden. 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 Okay. Yeah, Umio. Yeah. Yeah. How far is it? Like 1,000 kilometers or oh. something like that. Okay. <laughs> Not so far. So now it's up to North Yeah, and then, and then back to Umeå. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Should be good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, as long as the weather holds, yeah, no, it'll be good. It's, yeah. Uh, now it's perfect. spring, they say. <laughs> yeah. Now the spring starts. It's nice, though. Yeah. Have you done a trip like this before in yeah, Norway? I did. Oh, okay. The same way. Yeah, the same thing. Yes. Oh. And you recruited <laughs> the sister. That's very cool. So that was cool. There was uh, two Norwegian sisters who flew to the North Cape and then they're biking down to the Lofoten Islands here in Norway. Um, the one sister has done this trip before on her bicycle and she recruited her other sister uh, to go with her on this trip. So that was pretty cool. Very nice people.
it's a little after 6 p.m., almost 6.30. I've gone 76 and a half kilometers, and I'm gonna start looking for a place to camp. It's getting pretty cold, <laughs> and I'm pretty tired from not sleeping last night. So, just gotta find a place. Time for Darren's stealth camping lesson. So on this side of the road, are a bunch of private cabins and you basically just cannot camp on this side of the road. On this side of the road, on the other side of that hill is a river. So between the road and the river is a small sliver of public land essentially. And that's where I'm looking to camp. Um, it is pretty barren out here. There are no trees really. So what I'm looking for is a hump, a hump that I can hide behind um, overnight. And if you look right here behind me, this is a pretty good sized hump. So my plan is to go, that's hard to point, okay, over there and around this hump on the back side and I'm gonna camp over there because the cars driving by on the road won't be able to see me, the people that live in the cabins up there won't be able to see me, and I'll have my own private view of the river on the other side. So that's what I'm thinking, and that's where I'm going. All right, so I've got my camp all set up. Let me give you a quick tour of where I am right now. Here we are. I am essentially camped on the edge of a ledge overlooking a river in northern Norway, up above the Arctic Circle, only about 150 kilometers south of the North Cape, which is the highest point that you can essentially bike to or drive to in all of Europe. So. Here's my bike, obviously. There's the bike, and then over here, let me scoot back, is my tent. And look at the view here. So I have the front door looking out to that sort of a view, which is pretty spectacular. And it's really like a 180 degree view, going all the way over here. Not too bad, huh? And I've got my solar panel out front uh, pointed towards the sun just to get some charge off of it. It's not super sunny right now, but it is actually charging. And inside the tent here, nothing too fancy. I've got my two front panniers stacked on top of each other. My two rear panniers are back here. Sleeping bag, sleeping mat, water, tripod, handlebar bag, and that's about it. So. Um, like a lot of people, they always ask me like, how do you afford these trips, you know? And one of the things that I like to think about uh, is that like you can live like a millionaire without actually being a millionaire. And today I feel like, I feel like a million bucks, you know? Um, it was a good day, I ran into like a bunch of people that knew Bicycle Touring Pro, knew who I was from my videos or Instagram or blog or whatever. Um, so that was really cool. I think I met nine total bike tourists and five of them knew who I was, so that's pretty good. 
Um, what else? And then, and then today, the scenery was spectacular, and my campsite now is really spectacular. So um, I'm living like a millionaire on a minuscule budget. That's what's going on here. I am going to cook some uh, burritos tonight. I got beans, lettuce, tomatoes, tortillas, that sort of a thing again. And I have new uh, fuel for my camp stove, so I don't have to worry about running out of fuel. Um, I'm gonna set my stove up now and enjoy the view. So tonight for dinner, I've got tortillas, lettuce, tomatoes, two different types of beans, and that's it. <laughs> so I'm gonna make uh, campfire burritos. And I'm gonna do it with this view from the front door of my tent. Oh yeah. So there's this book called The 4-Hour Work Week, and if you haven't read it already, you should. I'll put a link to it down in the video description below. Um, but that's the book that when everyone asks me, like, how do you make the money to do these bike tours all around the world? I say read the 4-Hour Work Week, because that book explains how I do it exactly. Um, but there's a part in that book where Tim Ferriss, the author, says that like a lot of people want to be millionaires, but, but they don't actually want like a million dollars in their bank account. What they actually want is the lifestyle that a million dollars can afford you, basically. And, and, but then he goes on to say that like a lot of the things that people want to do, like traveling the world, for example, don't actually cost a million dollars. So in reality, you don't want to be a millionaire, you just want to have enough money to travel the world or do whatever you want, right? And so yeah, that's something that I try to keep in mind, um, it, especially when I'm in a place like this, is like, I am not a millionaire, but tonight at least, I have a million dollar view from my campsite and it doesn't cost me a single cent. The only thing I had to pay for today was my food. So 15 US dollars in food today. That's it. Um, to live like a millionaire here in northern Norway up above the Arctic Circle. So it might not look like it, but it's nine o'clock at night right now. It's still very, very light out. Um, it feels like two in the afternoon or something. But uh, yeah, I don't really want to go to bed even though I'm totally exhausted. I did not get any sleep at that campground last night. I'm gonna sleep so much better right here on the edge of this cliff overlooking this river than I did last night in that parking lot. Um, that was a really nice campground, by the way. Um, like all the amenities, super nice people, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was just too many people around for me to like relax at night. There were people walking past my tent, uh, you know, cars coming in, cars coming out. I just couldn't get to sleep. So anyways, um, this is going to be much more relaxing. I got the river flowing down below me. Like, you know, people buy those noise machines, like, and it's like whales calling and the beach sounds and stuff like that. Well, I have like a natural Arctic Norwegian river rushing right down below me, 100 feet below me or something, with birds calling and, ah, oh, it's gonna be great to go to sleep to that. So, that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I will see you in the next one.
So I'm back on the road now, 150 kilometers until the North Cape. It is cold and dark and windy today. It's gonna be rough. Woo! Now that I'm like right on the sea, it is really cold, really cold. Um, I might have to put my pants on here pretty soon. But uh, yeah, it's about 100 and something kilometers to the North Cape, 125, something like that. It's gonna be a hard 125 though, I have a feeling. Cold, <laughs> yeah. So yesterday a bunch of the bike tourists I ran into said that when they were at the North Cape it was just super foggy and they couldn't see anything, like they couldn't see 10 meters out essentially because it was just so foggy. And that might be the case for me as well, but to be honest I won't be that disappointed if that happens. For me it's, uh, it's more about just getting there and the experience of getting there and stuff. I don't really care that much about seeing the North Cape, to be honest. Um, it's just a place to go. So, anyways, just thought I'd mention that. But I'm getting really close, which is nice. There's a reindeer down there. I see you. He's trying to hide from me. There he goes. Hi guys. I'm surprised there are so many reindeer here along the coast. Like that area, that barren area that I went through. Oh, there's more up there. Hey guys. <laughs> They're just sitting there in the grass. Um, anyways, yeah. Seems like all the areas I went through earlier today would have been better place for reindeer, but they like it here on the coast. I just saw something kind of large, maybe a sea lion or seal or something, maybe a dolphin, <laughs> uh, come up just right there. I don't see it now. Okay, there's something over there. It looks almost like a dolphin. It, I just saw it breach twice. Nope, there it was again. Did I get it? Yeah, that was it right there. I don't know what that was. There it is again. I don't know what it was, but it was something pretty big actually, like the size of a seal, but with a fin on its back. Um, darn, that would have been cool to see a, a whale or something. I don't know what it was. Like a small whale, that's what it looked like. Whew. I'm surprised there's not more people out here actually because this is the only road to the North Cape and it's like totally desolate right now. There's no one out here. Okay, back on the bike now. So far today I've gone 46 kilometers, 47. Average speed 17 and a half. 
total time on the bike. What was that, two hours and 40 minutes? And I still have quite a ways to go today. It feels like I've been on the bike all day, but it's only, uh, what time is it? 3.30. Check it out. Two things I just found on the ground here. One, this is like a sea anemone sort of thing. It's empty on the inside. There's nothing there. But anyways, that used to be a sea anemone. Right, and then, check this out. Crab leg. <laughs> Silver shop. All right, so I just pulled over because I see a tunnel coming up. This is my rear bike light and this is my front bike light. So I'm gonna mount them now and get ready for the tunnel. All right, here's the tunnel. Oh man. Almost three kilometers long. It's pretty long. Here we go. It's pretty dark in here. The camera can see better than I can. Can you see me at all? Because I can barely see anything. It is dark. I should take my sunglasses off. This is fun. I feel like I'm on a ride at Disneyland. There's water dripping all down the rock on your head as you ride. Not a lot of cars, which is nice. Yeah, this is a piece of cake and the incline is nothing. So, perfect. so bad. I've done about 62 kilometers for the day, 61 and a half. Um, I'd like to do another 30 or so if I have the energy. It's really cold and it just makes me want to go to sleep. Like my eyeballs are frozen and it just feels like, oh, I'll close my eyes and go to sleep. But uh, 30 more would be nice. So just going to keep on trucking. They're all running from me. You guys, you don't need to run, I'm okay. blasted by the wind right now. It's coming in at about 10 o'clock, so side wind, head wind. Oh, it's terrible. I'm barely going.
I like the brown, those black beans much more than that other stuff. So tonight for dinner I have burritos again. I also have tortilla chips. What else? Uh, some vegetable soup and hot chocolate. And I'm gonna do it all because I am so tired and so hungry. <laughs> And I need the fuel tomorrow to get me to the North Cape. So, whew, today was exhausting. Like, um, I did just over 100 kilometers for the day. Um, and honestly, like, that's about as far as I like to go. Like, I've cycled way further than that in the past. I think my the longest I've ever done in one day was 200, or no, 153 kilometers, or 153 miles, which I'm not sure how many kilometers that is, but I think it's like 250 kilometers. So like twice what I did today plus a little more. But anyways, um, I think like 80 kilometers has got to be like the ideal distance. That's closer to 50 miles. What I did today was 60 plus miles. So anyways, oh my gosh, I'm so tired see my breath it's quite cold it's not actually like as cold as I thought it might be I'm pretty comfortable I wore shorts all day today so um, yeah that would be awesome if the weather held out and tomorrow I was the only person at the North Cape wearing shorts <laughs> that would be good so. oh. so good. I got avocado too, so avocado makes a big difference. Can you see that? <laughs> it's really cold. Okay, I'm cooking soup now. So this is the soup packet that I bought. Does that look anything like the picture? No. All right, so here are my stats for the day. Total distance, 102 kilometers. Maximum speed. Average speed was 16.5, so just over 10 miles an hour. Total time on the bike today, 6 hours and 10 minutes. Woo-wee! Some reindeer right outside my tent, making a bunch of noise. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about you. Buddy, hook me up. There's another guy over here. Hey. Hey there. That was kind of cool. I don't know what time it is. Oh. They woke me up though, because they were going, uh, 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 uh. It is 2.30 in the morning. Oh man. Freaking tired right now. All right, so I started way down here 17 days ago or so. And now I'm way up here. This is the route that I did yesterday from that brown dot up to here. And now, today, the last day of my bike ride to the North Cape in northern Norway, I'm going to cycle from here through this tunnel into town, there's a small town here, and then up to the North Cape. And I'm hoping that there is a bus that goes from the North Cape down the coast back to this town here. I just don't want to cycle back the exact same way that I just cycled for 130 kilometers. So I'm hoping to take a bus from the, the North Cape back to here. And then from there, I'll continue my bike ride over here into Finland. And then back all the way down to Umeå, Sweden. So that's the overall plan. But today, the big plan is just simply to finally reach the North Cape, the northernmost road that you can basically cycle in all of Europe.
first thing first though, I gotta get out of bed, change my clothes, pack up my tent, pack up the bike, and then uh, the f there's a couple tunnels I gotta go through today. So 60 kilometers, two tunnels I think, and then the North Cape. All right, looks like a pretty good day. A little windy, really windy actually. But it looks pretty clear at the moment, so. Here we go. Okay, I'm back on the road now. Gonna mount up. I've got about one or two kilometers until the tunnel that goes under the water and over to that island. Here we go! North Cap today. I look so silly. I am totally underwater right now. This tunnel is so crazy. Woo! God, the cars are loud when they pass. It's scary. That was quite possibly the worst tunnel I've ever been. I was in my I was in my lowest gear for much of the the ride out. Scary as hell. Damn. I don't know when to do that again. All right, here's the next big tunnel. Four and a half kilometers long. It's about half the distance or so of the first one, a little bit longer. Oh, yeah. I've just about made it to town here. I'm gonna stock up on food.
so I loaded up on food. I got so much food on my bike right now. It's really heavy. Ugh. But I got about 30 more kilometers to go now until I get to the North Cape. So, here we go. I'm a little less than 30 kilometers away from the North Cape now. And part of me just wants to like sprint and get there. But the reality is I'm going 14 kilometers an hour and struggling to go that fast because it's really windy right now. I'm behind a little hill at the moment, so it's not quite as windy, but I think it's gonna take me two more hours to get there. So that's not a sprint. That's a, that's a long, slow drag to the north. Can you see around me? Snow everywhere. This hill is so killer. I'm almost to the top, I think. It's flattening out a little bit. Woo! Good scenery everywhere. It's awesome. All the other bicyclists I've met have said that they had really bad weather when they got to the North Cape. Today it's kind of, I can see blue sky ahead of me sun's out a little bit, so I think I got really lucky. Seven kilometers now. I'm so close, but this hill is so big. It just keeps going up and up and up. I think I'm almost at the top. Two kilometers to go. I just can't wait to get there. One last hill. 500 meters and then I'm there. Ah! And just like that, I'm in Norca. So here I am at the North Cape. A bunch of people taking their picture with a globe there. Um, behind me is the sea. <laughs> and not, there's no land north of here. So um, this is it. It is really cold and I wish that I could just snap my fingers. And the bike tour is over right now. But I gotta get all the way back to Umia, Sweden over 1200 kilometers away. So I am going to uh, try to jump on a bus here and travel back down the road for about 130 kilometers because I don't want to cycle what I just did over the last two days again. Um, so I'm going to try to do that and then I will continue my bike ride back to Umia, Sweden. So I hope you can hear me okay. There's a waterfall, small trickling waterfall right behind the camera. So I'm gonna try and speak loud. So I made it to the North Cape. Um, I got there, took a couple pictures, <laughs> looked around. There was really, it was kind of anticlimactic to be honest. Like, it was just like, okay, I made it. Cool, let's turn around and go back. Um, but I guess that's why they say, you know, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey and I think that in this particular case, that is exactly, um, you know, what I'm experiencing. Is like it, it for me was not about reaching the North Cape. I was just like some place to go, um, but it was about all the moments in between. So it took me like 17 days or so to get there from Umia, Sweden. I took two rest days along the way, so I think 15 days of total cycling. 
and about 1250 kilometers total. I'm not sure what the average daily distance is there, but I'll do that on my calculator tonight. I'm guessing it's around 70 or 80 kilometers a day. Anyways, um, so I, after reaching the North Cape, I looked around, they had like a little museum, a light show, a movie, um, and then I went back out to my bike, and as I was going out to my bike, um, there were these other bikers there on obvious touring bicycles, and the man in the group said, I thought I recognized that bicycle, and he knew that I was the bicycle touring pro. And uh, so yeah, him and his wife, and I think a friend, I'm not exactly sure, but they're from Australia, and they're touring here, that kind of uh, all over Europe. Um, they, they were already on the Lofoten Islands in Norway, which is a place I went last summer. So yeah, they, they were pretty excited to see me, I guess, and I was excited to see them. Um, it's always cool to, to meet people on the road that are actually out doing these bike tours like I teach. So that was really cool. And as we were all there, this other guy, like a French guy, came out and to our group and he's like, hey, hey, um, I, I was in the room back there and I saw you and you're Darren Al from Bicycle Touring Pro, you know? And I thank you so much for all your videos and website and everything. So right there I had like, a whole bunch of people who knew Bicycle Touring Pro and were actually out doing bike tours for themselves. So that was really cool. We took some pictures and then I jumped on a bus. I didn't want to cycle all the way back to Honigsvea or wherever I am right now. Um, I just jumped on the bus. It was $20 for 30 kilometers. It was really expensive, I think, but there was only like three people on the bus. So anyways, I paid the 20 bucks, rode back to town, and now it's nine o'clock at night and I don't have anywhere to stay. So I rode just a short distance out of town and I found this place right here. Um, and yeah, I'm the road is basically right behind that little mound right there. So it's very possible that I could be discovered tonight, but I don't think that's gonna be a problem. It's like not illegal to camp here. It's just like I'm right on the side of the road practically. Anyways. So that's it. I'm just gonna climb inside my tent now, make some food for dinner, and call it a day. I cycled 60 kilometers today, but it was pretty hilly actually, like going up to the North Cape. So if you ever bike from Umia, Sweden to North Cape, Norway, just know that the last day is probably the hardest day of the entire trip. Okay, that's it guys. I'm Darren Al from BicycleTurnPro.com. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you out on the road sometime soon. Good morning, Darren Alf here from BicycleTurningPro.com. I am in Honingsvog, Norway right now, and yesterday I rode my bike to the North Cap, the Nord Cap, uh, the northernmost point that you can essentially cycle to in all of Europe. So um, this is kind of where I was yesterday, that red dot up there, if you can see that. And this is where I am now. And today the plan is to jump on a bus with my bike and go to here, to Old, I think it's called Olderfjord, and get off there and continue cycling down this way towards Finland. I am taking a bus just so I can skip over this like 100 kilometers, which I've already cycled. Like I literally did it yesterday. So I don't want to cycle it all again. Um, so I'm just going to jump on the bus and continue cycling south. All right, I'm leaving my stealth campsite now, heading towards the bus station. It's just a couple kilometers away. So it seems 
seems like I got to here just in time. The bus comes in about 45 minutes. So I'm just gonna hang out, maybe check my email if possible, and then get ready to jump on that bus. So I just got off the bus now in Oberfjord and I'm back at this like tourist stop. Um, I'm just gonna fill up my water bottles and then continue south down the road. All right, so I'm leaving Oberfjord now. I've got my snow pants on and both jackets, but it's pretty warm here actually. I'm gonna probably have to change back into my shorts in just a few minutes, but for the moment I'll cycle out of town and then change later. So I just changed into my shorts. It is so much warmer today than it was the last couple days. So much warmer. Like if I wasn't cycling right now, I wouldn't even need my, my rain jacket that I'm wearing. It's just the, the self-generated wind that you create by biking that makes it a little cold while you're cycling. So I got my rain jacket on, but honestly, I don't even know if I need that. It's really nice today. I just stopped at this little roadside bathroom and uh, look in here. It says, Crest and me, I don't know who that, that's maybe the guy's name. Crest and me from Portugal to Nordcap by bicycle. Pretty cool. There's also a bunch of this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus leva. Jesus on herra. Apparently, Jesus also said, Go unto the world and graffiti my name in public bathrooms. I'm gonna try to find a place to camp here pretty soon because it looks like it's gonna rain very soon. Alright, so I had to jump inside my tent here pretty quick. There's mosquitoes outside. Today is the first day of this entire trip that I've been bitten by a mosquito.
it just started raining. I'm cooking my dinner here and I'm hiding kind of in the tent because there are mosquitoes. But uh, yeah, I'm just trying to finish the food and then I'll dive inside and eat it in the tent here. All right, so I got my pasta here. You may have noticed that uh, I'm not wearing my hat and my head is shaved. Um, a lot of people actually have asked me like, why do I always have a hat on? And um, the reason is usually because I have helmet hair. <laughs> um, you know, you wear a helmet all day long and then you get those spikes down the middle. Um, and so usually when I get off the bike, I immediately put my hat on to cover up my hair. But the truth is I, I usually shave my head like this or a little shorter um, at the beginning of pretty much every one of my bike tours. And the reason I do that is because a shaved head is like easy to maintain, obviously. Like I haven't even thought about my hair on this entire trip. Um, also like when I'm doing these longer bike tours and I'm away from home for several months on end, shaving my head allows me like to grow out my hair for weeks or months. Sometimes I've gone like five months just letting my hair grow out. So, um, or longer actually. And, um, and third, I kind of like shaving my head because it allows me to like think of my bike tour as a new beginning. Like, so I shave that thing off, shave all the hair off right before the start of the tour. And I just feel like a new person, you know? And, um, there's this, let me grab it really quick. There's a book called There Are Other Rivers, and it's written by a guy named Alistair Humphreys, who cycled around the world for four years. I've mentioned him several times on BicycleTurnPro.com before. But um, yeah, Alistair has this book called There Are Other Rivers, and in that book, he talks about shaving his head. This is the quote from his book. It says, cutting my hair is partly pragmatic and partly symbolic. It's about leaving things behind. It's a new start. It's a simple indicator as the hair begins to grow back of how long I have been on the road. It's a reminder that I am going away to simplify things, going where vanity and fashion are irrelevant and only personal performance is important. And it is a demand to myself to toughen up and to stop taking myself too seriously. So that's kind of the way I think about shaving my head, right? And I, I just really like that quote from Alistair. If you haven't read There Are Other Rivers, it's a really good book. It's very short. You could read it in one sitting probably, but it's really, really good. Anyways, I'm going to eat my dinner now. Today has been kind of a short and weird day. I am going south now, which is really strange because for the entire bike tour up to the Nord Cap, for the last two and a half weeks or whatever, the sun has been behind me all day long and now it's in my eyes, you know, it's in front of me. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a weird feeling to be going south now. But anyways, another good day out here on the road. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay tuned for tomorrow's video and I hope to see you out on the road sometime soon. All right, I'm back on the road now.
So I just pulled off the side of the road to take a break here and blow my nose. The cold is making my nose run like crazy. Uh, while I was here, I just thought I would take a moment to talk about my new bike, the Comotion Cycle Siskiyou Touring Bicycle. I've been getting a lot of questions about it because it's a brand new bike for me on this particular trip. And um, it's got some really fancy features. It's got S&S &S coupler, couplers, which allow you to split the frame in half so you can pack it on an airplane and fly the bike for free, essentially. It's got a pinion gearbox, a gate carbon belt, and a whole bunch of other cool things, really high-end components. Uh, I will do a full review of the bike later. I don't like to jump into reviewing products like after a day or something like that. Um, I know a lot of magazines and websites and stuff do do bike reviews after like five minutes of riding it around a parking lot. I do not like to do that. I like to thoroughly test the products. The one thing I will say about this bike is that um, it's kind of flawless in a lot of ways. Like I just haven't had any problems with it. Um, so there's not a lot to say at this point. And I think that's a good thing, obviously. I don't know if you know this or not, but I have a degree in filmmaking. Um, that was what I studied in university. So I have a degree in editing and sound uh, for movies and stuff. And one of the things that they taught us in university is that if your movies are basically like, if, if the audience can watch your movies and not notice the editing or the sound design, then you've done, done a good job. You know, and if they're noticing that like the editing is weird or the, that sound doesn't seem right or something, then you've done something wrong. And that's kind of how I feel with this bike right now is like, there's nothing to report wrong with it really. <laughs> so yeah, I really, really enjoying it. Um, I will do a full review very, very soon. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, I gotta get going. Um, my battery is about to die on the camera and I still have several kilometers I want to cover today. So um, yeah, I love the bike and uh, it's working great. All right, here we go. Yeah. So I just went inside this tourist office that you see behind me and the guy in there, Lars, he said that I could charge my camera batteries in there, so I just dropped them off, let them charge for two hours, and I gotta be back before four o'clock, before they close, so um, I'll at least get one battery charged. That was a good little stop. I got some pizza, downloaded podcasts, and now I'm going back to pick up my batteries. Hey. <laughs> It's, a, it's called Co-Motion Cycles. They're made in America. It's like a handmade bicycle. Just after your length of your length. Yeah, and they do like custom paint and everything. So I, I told them I wanted red, white, and black. And yeah. and yeah, and have you seen this before? It's a battery machine. No, no, no battery. <laughs> it's a, there's no battery. It's, it's just all of the gears are in here. So there, there is no battery though. It, there's just nothing, no gears on the back. They're all and, up front. And no traditional chain. Right. Ribbon. Yeah, exactly. It's a belt, like a, ah. it's a carbon. Oh like, man, yeah, I've seen pictures of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's maybe, super smooth. Maybe this is the future. I think so. All right, so that was a good pit stop there. Got some food, charged my batteries a little bit. I got one and a quarter battery charge, maybe. Um, the guy at the tourist info center was really nice. Very interested in my bicycle, which is cool. And now I'm on the way. I wanna do, it's already like 4.30 in the afternoon. I wanna do at least like two more hours of cycling. So maybe 30 kilometers and then I'll call it a day.
I'm climbing a big old hill right now. You know, it's one of those hills where, like a lot of hills you can just kind of roll over or slowly shift down as the hill gets steeper. This was this one where you had to like immediately switch down like 10 gears because it just when it started going up so fast. Ah. So, as I was biking down the road just a moment ago, I passed a sign saying that this whole area here that I'm walking through in this forest used to be one of the largest, if not the largest, field hospital in all of Europe for World War II. Yeah, basically this was a hospital out here in the woods serving, there was an airport nearby which was Northern Europe's largest airport and during the war. And so anyways, this area operated as a hospital and then in 1944 when the Germans retreated from the area, they essentially burned everything down, blew it up, and everything out here now is exactly as it was since that time essentially. Rust has, you know, taken over the metal and basically it's just uh, the slabs of buildings and stuff. This area behind me used to be a bathhouse and a laundry facility and up here are some homes or at least the remains of the homes of the red cross doctors and a whole bunch of other things uh, that were in the hospital so I'll, i'm just kind of checking it out it's pretty interesting i love these places though where they they don't try to necessarily fix it up like th look at this this is really cool it's an old car like they just literally like left that here from 1944. That is cool and there's another one over here. All right. I think a lot of places in the world are kind of ruined in a way when they try to fix them up too much. Here's just another old car sort of thing. Like um, I went to Machu Picchu in Peru when I was there and I felt like I was at Disneyland or something. It, it was really cool and very beautiful. Like they fixed it up really nicely. They have manicured grass and all of that sort of thing. But it felt inauthentic to me um, compared to like a lot of other ruins that I saw in Peru as well. So like this I think is really interesting just because you're seeing it as it is, you know, unpolished. It's a little scary. I'm walking across a scary cable bridge. It, God, this thing moves. If you have balance problems, do not walk across this thing. So you can see here we got some old buckets. There's an old bed frame. I don't know, it looks like some parts of a stove or something like that. Just all over the place here. You gotta look closely, but um, yeah. I mean, just like, <laughs> you know. So I'm standing now in the center of the remains of a large building that used to be used by the Red Cross during World War II, uh, where they housed the soldiers that they were treating for various ailments. Um, and injuries. Um, what you can see behind me is a basically the remains of a row of beds. So this is like the exterior wall that you're seeing right here. And then right down here and on the other side of the building over there, kind of this direction, is a basically a row of, of beds. And I'll point them out here just so, but you can see here, 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 here. And they continue on this side of the building as well here. There's another one over there, some more in the back, etc. But on this side of the building also. So there's a whole row of beds going down there. And in, scattered in between here, I'm not exactly sure what everything is, but it looks like the remains of like a chimney or a stove of some kind. Right here at my feet, this is the remains of a, you can see it, it's like a bathtub, basically. A big, you know, I don't know what this is. Metal wash basin, essentially. 
And yeah, there's all kinds of stuff scattered around here. I'm not exactly sure what it all is. See, this looks like the front of a, a chimney or a, you know, a stove door. Basically, you open that up and throw the fire in, in there or something and then slam it shut. So all kinds of stuff like that scattered around here. Really, really interesting. Can anyone stop the noise that's inside my head? A voice that keep telling me things, horrible things about you. In this big hole that you see behind me, this was a barrack housing the kitchen and the administration for the hospital. And there's a whole bunch that you can kind of see parts of the old stove and stuff in here. Um, I don't know what else is down here, but a bunch of concrete and blown up stuff. But uh, nearby here, there's a there's kind of like a little hill where they believe there was a, a fortification where they had machine guns and stuff. Um, and yeah, anyways, there it is. Well, that was a cool little surprise. Um, I'm glad I stopped to check the place out. See, like, that's kind of what I like about bike touring a lot of times, is like these places you've never even heard of. And no one would ever tell you about this place, really. But it's kind of cool just because, because I stumbled across it, you know? And I kind of like enjoy, I kind of enjoyed that, for example, more than I enjoyed going to the North Cape two days ago, even though the North Cape is like the destination that everyone's trying to get to. Um, in a way, I enjoy this sort of thing more. the top of the hill. Yay, party! Woo! <laughs> it's almost seven o'clock at night. I'm gonna start looking for a place to camp. Uh, I've gone just over like 60 kilometers. Not very far. Yeah, 63, 64 kilometers for the day. So, not a big day, but a good day. I should have maybe stopped back there where all the trees were because now I'm in this brown Lapland area where it's gonna be very hard to find a place to camp and be secluded. Uh, oh well. If you know how to stop the noise that's inside our head don't stop telling us things, horrible things about counting again. All right, another good day complete. Camp is set up. I cycled about 70 kilometers today, which is one of my shorter days on this particular bike tour, but it was a good day. I was able to get into town and I spent almost four hours in town uh, charging my camera batteries, eating some food and conversing with the locals. Because I spent some time charging my camera batteries today, I thought it would be a good time to show you the various electronics that I'm carrying with me on my bike tour including the two cameras that I use to document my travels. So I should probably start by showing you the main camera that I use to document my trip. And it's this one here, which I have mounted on a tripod. Uh, it's the Canon G7X Mark II. It's a small kind of point and shoot sort of camera. 
um, but it's very powerful. It's not a big DSLR. I used to carry a big DSLR camera with me with different lenses, and I wanted something smaller, something that uh, would be better for shooting video, and so I got this, and I'm really enjoying it. This is my first bike tour with this particular camera. I'll do a full review or something later, but I really, really like it. So I'm using the G7X Mark II as my main kind of vlogging camera that I use to capture the video and take photos of my bike tour here in Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Um, the tripod is essential as well for because I'm out here by myself. Um, any shot that you see basically of me in it, uh, it, it's with the camera on the tripod. This is the rest of the stuff that I am carrying with me. I'll point out some of the the things. I've got a uh, GoPro, I don't know what model this is exactly, but it's a GoPro and I have it on the handlebar mount here. This is the new uh, like bicycle handlebar mount, which let me just show you like you press this button down on the side and you can very easily turn the camera in different directions, which is nice. Something that was not um, a part of their older handlebar mount. So anyways, I use that quite a bit. And also like when I'm just filming myself on my bike, I just hold it like this in my hand and film myself riding. So there's that. I have a universal power um, adapter thing, which allows me to plug in my American electronics into European outlets. It also has a USB charger on the side. That's what I really like about this one. Um, so I use that quite a bit. I have, well, this is my other camera. This is my backup camera. This is the small point and shoot camera that I used to document my bike tour in Colombia and Ecuador recently. And this camera costs about $125 or so. Um, whereas the one I'm shooting this with right now cost me about $900. So there's quite a difference in the quality of these two cameras. But I really like the fact that this, the sound coming out of this camera, I think is actually better than the one coming out of this camera. And it's because the microphone here is on the front. Whereas this camera, the microphone is on the top of the camera. And so I don't think... Like when I'm shooting my um, videos when I, of myself while I'm riding on my bike, the sound kind of comes, the wind kind of comes over the top of the camera and, and just makes the sound coming out of this camera really, really bad. Um, whereas this camera, because the microphone's on the front, the sound comes over the top of the camera and doesn't interfere so much with the sound. Anyways, so I've got two bike lights. These are both USB powered bike lights. Uh, this one's made by Blackburn, I think. Yep, and this one's made by Nog. Um, this is my smartphone. It's just a Samsung. I don't know what it is exactly. It's something. <laughs> it's Samsung Mini. That's what it is. And uh, I have earphones. This is another uh, European power adapter. Um, so I can charge my. I can charge two things at once. That's the purpose for having this and this. Um, then I have two different camera battery chargers. This is the charger for this camera. This is the charger for this camera. And then I have um, four total batteries for my bigger Mark II camera. Um, and I have four, five batteries for this smaller backup camera. Now, I am carrying a solar charger. This is the Voltaic 6 watt solar charger. And I have two batteries in here, one here that is charging and another backup as well. I also am carrying a uh, USB cable. This is a, um, I have two cables actually. One is here and one's in my other bag, but um, two cables to charge. Oh no, there's the cable right there. Um, so this is the cable to charge my GoPro and this is the cable to charge my smartphone and my bike lights, um, different cables. Um, this is a small backup battery, very similar to these batteries here. Um, the only difference is these can only be powered or only be charged by the solar charger. And this one can only be charged by plugging it into a wall, like plugging it in here, for example. So I think that's pretty much it. Those are all the electronics I'm carrying. Um, I... Like I said, I, I used to carry a large DSLR camera with various lenses, a wide angle lens and a 50 millimeter lens and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was able to produce some really high quality stuff, I think. But 
uh, I've been focusing so much on video recently that I found that the, these much smaller cameras, like the one I'm shooting on now, uh, makes it just so much easier for me to do what it is I'm doing right now. Um, you know, it focuses automatically on my face, uh, whereas my old DSLR didn't really do that. I know other more modern DSLRs do, but um, it's just lighter, smaller, easier to travel with, easier to carry in my hand while I'm cycling on the bike. And so, yeah, that's a quick overview of my gear. If you have any questions, like, let me know. Leave a comment down below or something. I am going to cook my dinner now. I have pasta and, like, veggie sandwiches that I want to make. So, I got to find some water, though. I've only got one water bottle, and I don't want to waste it on the pasta. So, I gotta, I'm got i going to find some water, do a little hike, find a creek nearby, get some water, boil it, use that to make the pasta, and then I'll keep the water I have now for drinking water. Good morning, Darren Alf here from BicycleTouringPro.com. I am somewhere in the middle of nowhere in northern Norway. This, if you can see here, is the route that I've kind of taken from Umia, Sweden up to the North Cape in northern Norway, and now I'm headed back to Umia, Sweden through Finland over here. Oops, excuse me. So I'm at this little dot right there. It's kind of hard to see. Um, and Today, I'm going to cycle this direction, and this line right here, that's the border between Norway and Finland. So, that's about 50 kilometers away from where I am right now, and I'm probably going to camp somewhere over here tonight. So, that's the plan. Um, i got to get out of my tent, pack everything up for the umpteenth millionth time, pack up my bike, hit the road, and cycle towards the border of Norway and Finland. Looks like another beautiful day here in northern Norway. Can you see those mountains behind me? Nice, huh? All right, I just made it into town. I'm gonna look for the library right away, see if it's open. So I can charge batteries, check internet, that sort of thing. I just went into the tourist center here and uh, they wouldn't let me charge my camera batteries. I asked, I said, can I charge my battery for like an hour while I go shopping? No, they weren't up for that. <laughs> the last place, they were so nice, they didn't want me to leave. The guy stayed for 15 minutes so I could stay, charge my battery for 15 more. And, these people won't even let me stay for five minutes. So I just stocked up on food and water and spent the last of my Norwegian money. Now I'm cycling out of town. It's a short, I think 10 kilometers or so until I get to the border of Norway and Finland. So saying goodbye to Norway here. I'm glad the scenery has changed back to trees and forests. I didn't like that brown stuff I was in last night. So every once in a while, 
Here in Norway, they have these yellow trash cans along the side of the road, and I hold on to all my trash until I find one of these. So, I got a bunch of trash in here that I have to get out and dump. Like this yogurt container, for example. Yeah. And I have more in there, I gotta dig it out. Okay, trash is dumped. Time to get back on the road. to Norway now and hello to Finland. There's the sign. All right, in we go. So that was my third time in Norway and this is my third time now in Finland. I thought Finland was supposed to be flat. 10% grade? What is this? I've been in Finland for five minutes now and Finland is kicking my ass. This hill, I just got up what I thought was the top, and then I see that it just keeps going. Uh, hopefully that is the top up there. Oh my goodness, I thought I was at the top again, and I'm not. It's still going up. Oh dear. Mind games. I think the trick is just don't look up. Just look down, look down. Don't look up. Yes! I made it to the top. Of course, it goes down and then up and down and then up like a thousand more times, but I made it to the top of this hill. So it's about 4.45 at night right now, and there is nobody out on the road. I haven't seen another car for 20 minutes or so. Um, and that's something I've noticed pretty much every day is that right around five o'clock, the traffic just decreases dramatically. Here's a car coming up right behind me now, as soon as I say that. <laughs> but I think, you know, just like anywhere else in the world, five o'clock comes, people are home for dinner or camped out or whatever, and, and I'm just out here to enjoy the road to myself, almost entirely. Well, it was down in that valley where all those pine trees were and it was really nice. Now I'm back in the Lapland brown arctic poo town. I don't like this stuff. Uh, I know a lot of people come to Lapland just to see this. It's like the arctic desert, but gosh, it's ugly. And it doesn't provide good coverage for wild camping. Uh, I'm tired. It's a lot hillier here than I thought it was going to be. Whew. A guy on a, an all red motorcycle, touring motorcycle, just passed me. He had red side cases, red motorcycle, red uh, jacket, motorcycle jacket, red helmet, everything. And as he passed, he was like, hey, check us out, we match. He didn't say that, but he motioned that with his body. And I was like, hell yeah, we match. <laughs> He's going a little faster than I am, but we, we match, all red. So I've gone 85 kilometers for the day and I'm in a nice little wooded area. So I'm kind of thinking of just camping here. It's really, really nice. Just looking for a place to camp now, I guess. There are a bunch of nice camping spots here. You can tell people have already camped here before, but uh, this forest is awesome. I love this kind of stuff. This is like my favorite place.
so this so this area is shaded essentially in a 360 degree circle all the way around so that's where i'm gonna camp here tonight there's also another small pond uh, over here so i have water nearby um, i can go check that out later but yeah i'm just gonna set my camp up here and hopefully i won't be woken up this morning by the sun For dinner tonight, I've got quite a spread. Um, I'm making this soup packet again, uh, vegetable soup, and I'm gonna chop up some of these veggies and put them in there as well. And then I just have some stuff to make vegetable sandwiches. I got bread, tomato, cheese, cucumber, a little butter, and some lettuce. So that's my dinner for tonight. It's really nice out. Um, the sun's out still. Pretty warm so I just have the rain tarp off and yeah I just hanging out here there are a couple mosquitoes but they aren't bothering me too bad at least not yet so anyways so I've got my uh, soup cooking on the camp stove and while I'm sitting here I thought I would talk to you about Norway today I crossed out of Norway and into Finland but um, I've spent quite a bit of time bike touring in Norway and because I just left the country I kind of thought now would be a good time to talk about some of my favorite areas in Norway for bike touring. Um, I've done, here's like a map of Norway, Sweden, and Finland and yeah Norway, Sweden, Finland and um, I've done trips in Norway down here in the Oslo area and Bergen and honestly like uh, I didn't I wasn't super impressed with Oslo um, but the Bergen area for bike touring is just fantastic there's so much around there um, so I would highly recommend Bergen Norway as a place to go bike touring um, then last summer I did quite a bit of bike touring up here uh, in the Lofoten Islands area, which is also uh, up above the Arctic Circle, where I am kind of right now, similar. And, but it's along the coastline and there's these massive mountains that like dive down into the ocean and you're, you can bike right along the edge of the water for so much of the trip, it's really spectacular. And then this trip, I was up in northern Norway, the northernmost point that you can go to essentially in all of Norway. And it was cold, um, but pretty much every single one of my trips in Norway has been pretty cold, even during the summer months, like all of my trips have been during the summer. And I would say that most days in Norway I'm at least wearing a light jacket, but there are on occasion days when I don't need that light jacket and I can just get away wearing a t-shirt or whatever. Um, those days are pretty rare, but it does actually happen. Um, overall, like Norway is a very expensive place to go, and I think a lot of people don't go there because of that. And I hesitated for many years on going to Norway because I had heard it was so expensive. Um, I wish now that I hadn't let that stop me from going there because Norway is now like one of my favorite places in the whole world. Um, for bike touring and just for visiting in general. So, um, yeah, I would highly recommend it. Sorry, I gotta stir my soup. Um, what would I say as far as the biking is concerned? Uh, it's good pretty much everywhere you go, to be honest. Like, I have not been to a part of Norway where I was like, oh god, this is terrible. Um, yeah. I, I, I honestly can't think of anything. If I had to recommend though, like one part of Norway to go to, if you had like only, let's say two weeks or something, a week or two, 10 days, 
Um, it would be very hard for me to decide between the more northern Arctic coast, sort of like Lofoten area, or the Bergen, Hardanger Fjord sort of area. Both places I think are pretty spectacular. I think if you're looking for more of the touristy um, sort of experience, then probably the Bergen, Hardanger Fjord, uh, that sort of area of all the fjords and stuff. Um, is probably the area that you want to go to. But if you want a more sort of off the beaten track, less populated, uh, a little bit colder, um, a little bit more unique experience, then I would definitely recommend Lofoten and that whole area. Basically like from the Lofoten Islands all the way up to the North Cape. Um, and that is in fact what a lot of people do like that's why i ran into so many bike tourists uh, while i was up in that part of the world just a few days ago is because what a lot of people do is they fly to the north cape um, to one of the nearby airports in alta or what's the honigschlotter or whatever it's called there's two cities there that you can fly into basically so they fly in there and then they bike south down the coast uh, through tromso norway and then down through the Lofoten Islands and then over to Bodo, Norway. And then they usually fly home or bus home or train home or whatever from Bodo. So um, I would highly recommend that. That's going to take more than a week though. That's probably like, well, it depends on how fast or how slow you go, but like three, could be three or four weeks depending on what you do. I think some people do it in like two weeks, but that's pretty fast. So um yeah that's my recommendation for norway i guess <laughs> those two areas if you have any other questions though let me know um i've probably spent about two or three months total biking in norway so i know quite a bit um all i can say now is i would highly recommend it so get your butt to norway all right <laughs> hello I'm Darren Alf from BicycleTouringPro.com. I'm in northern Finland right now in the middle of a 2,000 kilometer bike tour across Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And a few days ago, I asked you guys to send me your best questions on the Bicycle Touring Pro Instagram account. And so I wrote down some of the best questions that you guys sent in. And today I thought I would answer one of them. This question comes from Leonardo Gamas. He says, how do you deal with the hygienic issue while you're on a self-supported bike tour um, and camping in the wild? I ask this because I'm in love with the idea of doing a self-supported bike tour and camping, but I'm not a hippie guy. This is a good question for me to answer right now because as of today, I have been on the road for three weeks and I've only taken one shower. So how have I done that? Well, um, if you've watched any number of my videos from bike touring all around the world, you will know that I oftentimes bathe in lakes, rivers, and streams. So you'll see me kind of bending over in a lake or a pond or something and splashing water up on my face and washing that way. Um, sometimes I'm washing my legs off because your legs get really dirty when you're bike touring with dirt and grease and dust and stuff that comes up from the road. Um, and obviously these sorts of issues um, are worse when you're in a warm part of the world or a hot part of the world. Africa, South America, Asia, that sort of thing where you're just like sweating day after day after day. Here in Northern Europe, for example, it's quite cold. So that's part of the reason I'm able to go so long without showering is that I'm just a whole lot cleaner because I'm not sweating out as much as I would in other parts of the world. That being said, um, let's say that you're camping in a place like this where there is no river, pond, or stream around. How do you keep yourself clean? Well, let me take a moment and show you right now what I usually do. So the first thing is you wanna grab a water bottle off of your bike. That's the first step. So you get your water bottle and you might have some toiletries of some kind. I, you know, I have all my typical toiletries, deodorant, toothpaste, soap and all that kind of stuff in here um, but sometimes I don't even use the toiletry kit I basically just rinse all the dirt off of my face and don't worry too much about soap um, but uh, it depends on where I am and how much water I have available and that sort of thing some some nights I go to bed and this is all the water I got so for me 
drinking the water is more important than using the water to clean my face or my legs or something. So if it comes right down to it, I'm gonna save the water for drinking and not use it to splash on my face. But in this case, I'll show you, I basically just undo the cap of the, the water bottle here, make a little cup in my hand. Okay, take my hat off. <laughs> I, I uh, pour a little, just a little bit of water in my hand and then I, I wash basically like like a bird bath that's basically what we're doing here and yeah just getting all behind my neck and stuff and anyway so like with three little tiny drops from this water bottle i've essentially washed the majority of the gunk off of my face now i could use soap and you know rub it in again and and then uh, wash it off with a little bit more but look at how much or how little water I've used. Just this tiny little bit. So you can generally like wash your whole face with just maybe this much water from your water bottle. Um, and your legs are the other thing that get really dirty. So um, oftentimes, like I'm not washing my whole body, chest and arms and you know crotch and everything. I'm essentially just washing my legs and my face as those are the two areas that get the most amount of grime. So anyways, I hope that helps. That's kind of how I do it out here in the wild. Um, it's not obviously the same as taking a full-blown shower uh, when you're at home, but you'll be surprised at just how far this much water can go. All right, guys, I gotta pack up and uh, hit the road. All right, so I'm back on the road. Yesterday, the weather was pretty darn nice, to be honest. Today, it is dark, cloudy. It's not too cold, to be honest. It's a little cold, but not too cold. But it looks like it could rain at any moment. So, could be an interesting day. Um, I also got a question on Instagram about how I pit pitch my tent at night and how I select a place to camp and all that kind of thing so later today I will answer that question so stay tuned today is Sunday and there is like no one out on the road right now uh, this road is sparsely traveled anyways but god it's really quiet today when I was back in town two days ago at that information center in Lakselv, Norway um, the guy working there he said, where are you from? And I was like, oh, I'm from the United States, from California. And, and he said, oh, wow, you're the first person from the United States that we've ever had in here. And I was like, really? That's crazy. But I guess I'm not in a very popular, like, tourist area at the moment, so. But I just thought that was kind of crazy, wow. If it's true, first person from the United States, nuts. It is seven o'clock at night here in Northern Finland. I am out on the road by myself, having a blast. So I want to go like 15 more kilometers today, but as I'm riding, I'm looking for electricity. I will stop if I find public power outlets. That's what I'm looking for. I wanted to go a little further, but it's starting to rain pretty good. I think I'm gonna find a place to camp. I wanted to find electricity too. Dang it.
so this is like a totally fine place to camp actually i just pushed my bike the road is down below i like to usually camp above the road there's a small creek running nearby so i can wash my face get water to cook with wash my legs off whatever um, there's a flat spot here where i could camp and that would be fine however um, i don't typically like to um, camp on a road and there is a small like fire road here a dirt road a logging road something like that and so i don't typically like to camp near these things because today is sunday there's no one out but tomorrow is monday um, and it could be that at eight in the morning a bunch of loggers come up this road and there i am in my tent so what i'm going to do is go off in this direction i think up this hill a little ways and i think that i can not only find a more secluded spot but a spot with a spectacular view of the lake behind me and you might be able to see it through the trees there but the view's not so great from here i think if i go just 100 meters up this direction the view will be pretty spectacular Okay, so this is going to be the campsite for tonight, and as you can see, I've got a pretty spectacular view of this lake behind me here. Um, the reason that I wanted to come up here to show you uh, this particular campsite is for a number of different reasons. The main reason being that I asked you guys to send me questions on Instagram, and one of the questions that I got from Oregon Swede, he says, uh, how do you prepare your tent site? Specifically, how do you mark, make sure no punctures happen? So he's asking about getting a hole in your sleeping mattress or, or in the bottom of your tent. But there are a number of other things about selecting a campsite that I could talk about. In fact, I could probably talk about this subject for like two hours. But I won't do that right now. I'll just kind of hint on some things. First of all, I, I came up the road so I'm up above the road. The road is down there, kind of along the edge of the lake. So all the cars driving past can't see me up here. That's the first thing. Second of all, I am near a stream. So I have a water source, which is super nice. Uh, there we go. And third of all, I am off of the main logging road that is right there. So if those loggers or a hiker or, so, or biker or something does happen to pass on that road, I'm up above that road as well. So they can't actually see me unless they really kind of do a little bit of digging. So there's that. Fourth, I have a view and I'm always looking for campsites that are like scenic and interesting. You know, I kind of make it a game sometimes of like how can I find the best campsite. So there's that as well. Also, I tend to just sleep better if I know that I'm not going to be disturbed in the morning. If, if there's a chance that a hiker is going to come up that trail with their dog or something, like I do not sleep well because I'm just worried about that. You know, worry about them walking past my tent and taking my bike or calling the police and saying, hey, there's some weird guy camping up here or whatever. That wouldn't happen here in Finland, but it might happen in other parts of the world. So now that we're on to the actual place where I'm going to camp, let me just show you a couple things. I'm going to take the camera off the tripod. But this is kind of where I'm thinking of camping here. And you can see that there's kind of a whole bunch of stuff here. There's like a stick, you know. And so Oregon Swede was asking what do you, how do you prepare the site so that you don't get holes in your tent or your sleeping mattress. So I guess for me usually, I usually just use my foot and kick this stuff out of the way. Whatever, you know, might happen to be there on top. So there's another stick, right? Whatever. Okay, that one's not coming up. But anyways, so I kind of just kick it out. 
The other thing I should mention too is that if you are camping in a one person tent, which is what I am doing, um, your tent doesn't take up as much space. So it's very easy for me to find a very small patch of ground like I have here and put my tent there. If you have a two person tent or a three person tent, that makes it a whole lot harder to find a campsite like this. So um, that's just one thing to keep in mind when you're choosing your tent and a lot of bike tourists opt for a two person tent even though they're really just one person and a one person would work fine for them. Um, but it actually makes not only is like a two person tent bigger and heavier to carry on your bicycle, but it makes selecting a campsite at night a whole lot more difficult as well. So, um, basically though, like that is all the preparation that I normally do. I have traveled with people though in the past, like I, I was on a bike tour, I forget where this was, but, or when it was exactly, but I was traveling with this guy who used to be a boy scout and he, when, when he pitched his tent at night, he would like dig down, he'd like rip this moss out of the ground and dig down all the way to the dirt. And, and I was like, dude, what are you doing? You're not only ruining the forest, but like you're, that is the mattress that you are sleeping on. Like the moss and all that dead plant material and stuff, like that makes your camping site super soft and comfortable. So, I generally look for a spot that is covered in moss like that and um, happily pitch my tent there. The other thing that I normally do when I'm selecting a campsite and trying to figure out where exactly I'm going to put my tent is I will lay down on the ground, directly on the ground, just with my clothes on and everything, um, in the exact spot where I think my tent is going to go. So this is how I do it. And I usually just do that like super quick. Um, but I, I can kind of move around a little bit while I'm down there on the ground and figure out where the flattest, most even spot is. If there are any rocks or pine cones or anything down there, I'll remove those or, or select a totally different site if it is in fact too bumpy or too, sl too sloped. So um, there's that. Then I basically just pull out my tent and pitch. And I'll do that for you now so you can see that. So when I'm rolling the tent out initially, I will just roll it in the place where I think the tent is going to go. I then unfold the tent, kind of, just the bottom of the tent here. So now I've got the tent laid out on the ground. I have a ground sheet underneath the tent, which I'll show you. This is not the actual ground sheet that comes with the tent or anything. You can order a specific matching um, ground sheet, and I don't have that. Um, I am just using a thin sheet of plastic. This is painter's plastic, like you would have in your house when you're painting your house. You put this down on the ground or something so that the paint doesn't get on your carpet or wood floor. So I have just cut a small piece of plastic that I use underneath my tent. There's some dirt and stuff in there, that's all right. Anyways, so I put that down underneath the tent. And this not only protects the tent from getting a hole in it, but it also um, protects me from getting wet during the middle of the night while I'm sleeping. Because if, if the ground is wet down here, which it is a little bit because it's been raining, um, this ground sheet will stop that moisture from coming inside my tent and getting my sleeping mat and sleeping bag and everything else wet. The next thing I'll do, and I don't always do this, but in this particular case I will, I will lay down on the tent once again just to double check that I have the tent in the position that I want it to be for the entire night.
So if that feels good, then I basically set up the tent like normal, put all my stuff inside, and make camp. Now, the question that I got was about punctures and how do you prevent that from happening. Well, in this particular case, it's pretty mossy, so I don't have to worry too much about um, getting punctures in my sleeping mat. But in some parts of the world, you do have to worry there are plants with thorns, uh, things like that, glass could be on the ground. And I think it's just a matter of street smarts in those cases. Um, I'm out of breath. <laughs> Um, it's a matter of just paying attention to your surroundings. If you are in an area with thorns, for example, like I've biked through Africa and there were several places where you really did have to watch out for these thorny bushes that could not only puncture your sleeping mat, but puncture your tires on your bike as well. Um, you just had to be aware, you know? That's all that all there was to it. And if this area was covered in thorns, I simply wouldn't camp here. It's just that simple. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously I pick out the, the sticks, pick out the pine cones, pick out any big rocks that might be poking me in the back. And the other thing too is like, a lot of people will pitch their tent and then stick with it, even if it is uncomfortable or in a bad spot. And I think you have to be prepared to move your campsite, even just a couple inches sometimes, if it isn't working out for you. So those are my tips. Hope that uh, helps you a little bit in selecting a campsite uh, for yourself on your own bike tours. And if you have any questions, make sure you leave a comment down below. Check my website at BicycleTourningPro.com. Pick up a copy of my book, The Bicycle Touring Blueprint. And uh, message me on social media and just say hi. So thanks so much for watching, guys. And I hope to see you out on the road sometime soon. Darren Alf here from BicycleTurningPro.com. It's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know, even know what day it is. June 19th, I think, 2017. Um, I have been in my tent for the last 18 hours or so, and it has been raining the entire time. It is kind of just sprinkling at the moment, so it's let up a little bit. Um, but I do not want to get outside this tent because it is wet everywhere and I really don't want to cycle. So I'm just, today, I've decided to not move. I'm not moving. I'm just staying in my tent and like listening to podcasts and eating and stretching and writing stuff down in my journal and stuff like that. So, uh, one of those weird days. So there seems to be a small break in the weather here. I am going to walk down to the stream and get some more water because I'm almost out. Oh my gosh. Today has been a long day and I haven't done anything. Just laid in the tent. I woke up this morning, I think it was about 9 o'clock and it was pouring rain. And, and I knew right then that I just wasn't going anywhere today. Made the decision, I was like nope, and I went back to sleep. And I think I woke up at about 2 p.m. So I've really only been awake for like uh, three hours total today. Um, even though it's already after four o'clock, almost five now. Part of me is like tempted to just keep going right now, pack everything up and go, but it's like five o'clock at night. I wouldn't go very far and my main goal today was to go into town and go to the library and charge my batteries, but now that it's five o'clock, the library is surely closed. So I think I'm just going to stay put. I have plenty of food, um, bananas and bread and cucumber and trail mix. So plenty of food to get me through the night. I got the water. Um, I think I'm just going to hang out here and hope for better weather tomorrow. I have no idea what the weather is going to be. It is just gray everywhere. So it could be raining tomorrow as well. We shall see. So because the rain has essentially stopped, I decided to hike up the hill behind my campsite here so I could get a better view of the lake. And 
So that's what I'm doing right now, it's just, just going up. Oh yeah, that's a good view. Look at all those islands out there. So that's the direction I'm going, kind of that direction. This is the way I came from over here. Really nice. Today I am cycling not at all, but one of the big lessons that I've learned from my bike tours all around the world and doing this for 17 plus years, is that you gotta give yourself some time, some freedom to improvise. You know, a lot of people do these bike tours and they're on a very tight schedule, which is understandable, like they have one or two weeks off of work and they're trying to pack in as much as they can. Um, but when you're on a more loose uh, schedule, a longer schedule, like I am here, I'm, I'm on the road for a month, um, I try to at least schedule in some time so that I don't necessarily have to bike. So if it does rain and I can't really go anywhere on a particular day, I don't feel pressured to like get out of my tent, get soaking wet, get all miserable, and then end the day like grumpy and wanting to go home. So today's just one of those days, I guess, where the rain dictated my actions, but um, I think it's a good excuse for me to talk about the freedom to improvise and why that's so important on a long distance bike tour. All right, I'm back on the road now. Man, it is dark, foggy, misty, and freaking cold. Woo! Hey there, how are you? So I'm interested, uh, we make uh, two years ago a uh, vote uh, around the world. Oh, really? Wow. We have a homepage from this. Machine. Yeah, yeah. If you want to take a look. Yeah, I'll send you an email. Cool. Sabine and page and Jens. I like your, <laughs> your pictures. <laughs> That's cool. Wow. Sweet. I'll check it out later. Thank you. That was Jens and Sabine from Germany, and they are going up to the North Cape. Jens said he checked the weather for tomorrow and it's supposed to snow. Uh, okay, here we are in town now. Crossing the river. Looks like a pretty good sized town. All right, I charged up three of my batteries there in the library, answered some messages that were sent to me. It's almost four o'clock now, so I'm gonna go get some food, and then I'm gonna try to cycle as far as I can tonight. Maybe if I get 60 kilometers, that would be good. 80 would be better. 80 is what I'm aiming for. Okay, so I've been in the library for hours and it wasn't raining the entire time. As soon as I get on the bike, it starts to rain. Uh, I got my face mask on. It is so cold right now. I might have to stop and put my pants on too. Woo, it's cold. So I'm in the home stretch of my bike tour now. I've really only got about 290 kilometers left that I want to cycle. Nice little river. 
bike path going out of town here. Woo. I was looking online at the topographic information for the rest of my route here and it showed one big hill and I think I'm on it right now. And then everything after that was like pretty darn flat. I mean, there's obviously some small hills, but nothing huge. Check this out. It's raining pretty good right now. My jacket's fully saturated and looks like it could snow. There is some snow over there. But, uh, whew, getting a workout going up this thing. It's like cold and hot all at the same time. Okay, just started snowing ever so lightly, but it is snowing. So this is camp for tonight. Today was easily the coldest day of the entire bike tour and I know that just by feel, I don't really know what the temperature is. I had to wear the face mask today and I had to put my warm winter gloves on for the first time on the entire trip. I'm still wearing shorts, but uh, yeah, my legs stay pretty warm when I'm cycling. So uh, I, it's about 9.30 at night. Let me go over the stats here really quick. Can you see that? All right, so the stats for today. Total distance, 101 kilometers. What does that say? Uh, maximum speed, 37. Average speed, almost 20 kilometers per hour. Uh, what is the total time on the bike? Five hours and 15 minutes. And that's about it. So, yeah, pretty good, especially considering I didn't leave Avalo, Finland until five o'clock this evening. So, um, it's about, what time is it now? It's uh, 9.37 p.m. So, I'm gonna, it's still raining right now. Um, my face is just all wet. Um, I'm gonna set up my tent as quickly as possible, jump inside, change into my warm clothes, and then cook some food and listen to some podcasts. <laughs> I downloaded some new ones today, so I'm like super excited to just jump inside my tent and listen to them. All right, here we go. All right, so I'm in my tent. I just changed into my pajamas, basically. Warm socks, sweatpants, fleece jacket, and, uh, ooh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, 
Now I'm gonna get out the camp stove. I got stuff to make more campfire burritos, which is like my favorite. One of the reasons I really like traveling here in the Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, is they have Mexican food stuff at the supermarket, which is so great for me. I, I love it. So anyways, beans, lettuce, tomatoes, something else, tortillas, all of that, getting it out right now. Whew, it's cold. So I am like admittedly a terrible cook. And um, so people are always asking me like, what do you cook on the road, Darren? And I'm, I don't really like to answer the question because I'm just so bad at cooking. But what I have today is tomatoes. And I have three different kinds of beans in here. So I'm going to just mix all of this up. There we go. And I'm gonna cook all of this on the campfire stove. And then I just plop all of that onto a tortilla, put some lettuce on top, and that's my campfire burrito. I realize I'm not making it around a campfire, but I just like to call it campfire burrito, whatever. Good morning, Darren Alf here from BicycleTrainPro.com. I'm in my tent about 100 kilometers south of Ivalo, Finland, up above the Arctic Circle. It's been raining all night long, and there is a slight pause in the rain at the moment. It's still sprinkling, but I'm gonna get out of my tent and uh, pack up and get ready to go. I got a hundred more kilometers I wanna cycle today. It was really cold last night, like the coldest night of the entire bike tour that I'm on right now. I had to wear two jackets, down jacket, fleece jacket, t-shirt, fleece pants, snow pants and my winter socks on top of that and I was still a little cold when I went to bed so I think today is going to be a cold day also. So I'm all ready to go. I was packing up and um, then it started raining again. Can you hear that? I'm just going to sit here and wait until the rain subsides a little bit and then pack everything really quickly. I got all my bags packed essentially except for the sleeping mat. So I just gotta jump out of the tent, pack the tent, pack the sleeping mat, and then go. But I just don't wanna do it when it's raining like this. So sitting here and waiting. The coldest bike tour that I've ever done was in Ukraine, the country of Ukraine. It's right between Russia and Poland, kind of. And um, I did it like during the month of November, December. So it was like winter time, essentially and it was so cold. Um, I had basically like all the same gear that I have right now, snow pants, and I had bought these like $300 boots that I was wearing, um, And but it was just so cold and it was so foggy that you couldn't see more than, oh, I don't know, 50 feet or so in front of you most of the time. Yeah, oh my gosh, it was just so cold. It was so cold that I don't, I don't have any video because I wasn't really doing video from that trip on that trip But I barely have any photos from that trip too because it was just so cold that I didn't want to get my camera out and take a picture um, And I was sleeping outside in the forest every night and oh, it was just so hard in the morning to wake up and the nights were long uh, Yeah, and I didn't speak the language and oh gosh And then you would go inside like here when you go inside a supermarket or something it, it's super warm so warm that like my nose just immediately starts dripping like crazy. Um, but in Ukraine, it wasn't like that at all. Like you went inside the supermarket and it was like colder in there than it was outside. I remember going inside this one place, it was like a stall kind of supermarket where they had like eight different vendors and you would walk around kind of in a circle and buy different things from these different vendors. And everyone, you could see the smoke coming out of their heads and, and their breath and God, it was like living in an ice box. Uh, it was so, so cold. But So this is like nothing compared to that, but I just hate getting wet. Um, and yeah, it's, it's gonna be a fun day. <laughs> I was leaving my camp, it's 
started snowing like crazy for a moment, but it only lasted two minutes maybe. Now I'm on the road, it's raining still, it's really cold, colder than yesterday I think. Whew, it's gonna be miserable, this final stretch of the ride. So I've cycled about 60 kilometers now, and I'm coming into town, I got a, just a few kilometers to town. I'm on a bike path here. My left foot is completely frozen, like I can't feel my toes at all. I might just get food and stop here tonight. We'll see. I'm gonna check the map as soon as I get into town. It, it stopped raining, which is really nice, but guys, freaking cold right now. Like, really, really cold. So I'm just about in town now. The main thing I need is water. I have no water. I haven't been drinking enough either. I think I need to drink just like two liters. Today was very short. I only cycled about 66 or 67 kilometers, but gosh, it was so cold, so cold. Today was easily the coldest day of the entire trip, easily. I, my toes on my left foot are completely frozen. I need to get inside my sleeping bag and put my warm socks on, make some hot chocolate. Yeah, it is so cold. All right, so I'm inside my tent now and I'm already feeling a bit warmer. Put my hat on. Um, I got water, got my solar charger so I can charge my smartphone. I am going to cook burritos again tonight, but I also got yogurt and what else did I get? Hot chocolate maybe? And yeah, stuff like that. So, oh, I got an avocado. That's what I got. So, burritos with avocado. I'm so excited. Avocados here are $8 per kilo. So, I got this one little avocado. It costs like $1.50. But, anyways, that wasn't bad. I've paid $4 for an avocado, I think, in Norway on my last trip. It's crazy. Anyways. Avocados are good though, so I'm, I was willing to pay the four bucks. <laughs> All right, so I just finished eating. Um, it's so nice to be in the tent, but it is still very, very cold outside. I just wanted to show you kind of what the plan is because I've only got two more days that I can cycle. I've got two more days to cycle, then I got to jump on a bus, and travel back to Umia, Sweden. That'll take like a whole day. It's I think it's like a 10 hour bus ride or nine hours maybe. And then the following day, uh, June 25th, I'm checking into an apartment that I've rented in Umia, Sweden, and I'm staying in that apartment for the next 40 days or so. So I have to be back. The, the woman I'm renting the apartment from wants me there at 2 p.m. on June 25th. So I've got to start heading back. So this is my entire route. I started down here in Umia, Sweden, and I cycled up this way, all the way up to the North Cape. And now I'm cycling back down this way, and I'm right here, that little blue dot, if you can see that. My plan is to just basically get down to here somewhere, and then take a bus from there down the coast, whoops, and back to Umia. Ah, I messed up now. Okay, anyways. Um, so that's, that's what's going on right now and that's why in the next two days I, I can really only go 
to the next town, which is uh, Roya, Roya Hami or something like that, Finland. So I'll get on a bus there, I think, and then bus it back to Sweden. It's been an awesome trip. Like, I've really, really enjoyed it. And um, I'm going to be using my time in Umia, Sweden to edit all of these videos, uh, write an article about my trip, about, you know, my favorite places and what I'd do differently and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I got a bunch of other work for Bicycle Turn Pro that I'm going to be working on as well. So I'll be busy for those 40 days in Umia. And then after that, I'm doing another short bike tour here in Sweden and Finland with my friend Rob, who has done four, I think, other bike tours with me. So Rob is flying in from Canada, and he's bringing a friend of his named Doug, and the three of us, and maybe a couple other people actually, um, are going to be doing a short bike tour up the coast. Like, yeah, I won't show you now, but we're going to do a, a, a tour here in Sweden and Finland. And after that, I don't know what. I don't really have anything planned. I'm probably just gonna fly back to the United States. Um, I have to go see all my doctors again, which is no fun. And then I'm gonna do like a van slash bicycle tour across the Western United States during the autumn and winter months of this year. And I'll probably be in like California, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah maybe, Oregon and Washington, Idaho perhaps, um, that sort of an area. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be gonna be fun. Um, I'm 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 very much looking forward to getting back to Umia though because I haven't had a shower now in like two weeks. And I not that I feel like I necessarily need it, but my clothes have not been washed for almost a month now and I can certain thing like my pants I can just smell uh smell them so um yeah i'm looking forward to washing my clothes washing myself um being warm <laughs> cooking regular food you know things that i can't cook here maybe um and that sort of a thing but overall this has been a really fantastic trip it has been a little chilly at times um but other than that like i don't know if it gets much better than this that's my problem now is like I'm thinking about where do I want to go that could be just as good as this. And I'm having a hard time thinking of places in the world wh that I would like as much as this. I think one of the, the, you know, the main reasons I like this part of the world so much is one, the nature. There's just so much of it. You can pull off the road practically anywhere and camp. Two, the isolation. Like there's just no people around. Um, and for me, I love that. I just know myself and I know that I like these sorts of places in the world. And and when I, you know there are part there are places in the world that I do want to go like I'd love to go to India or something like that. But there's a whole lot of people in India and that scares me. Um so yeah, I'm going to have to do some serious thinking about where my next big international bike tour is going to be. I don't know. We'll see. Do you have any suggestions? Let me know. Leave a comment down below. All right, guys. I'm Darren Alf from BicycleTouringPro.com. Thanks so much for watching. I am going to climb inside my sleeping bag, get my feet warm. I hope to see you out on the road sometime soon. I've never been this excited to start my morning bicycle touring in Finland. Yeah! <laughs> the, the truth is, I am never excited to start in the morning. I'm, I, you can tell, look at my eyes, they're all just like, Ugh. I am tired. I don't want to move. I only have two days of cycling left, however. So um, I'm going to pack up my stuff now and ride about five kilometers into town, get some food, 
and then be on my way. The goal today is to cycle about 70 kilometers or so maybe, so not a super long day, but it should be a good one. We're off to a good start. Let's go. Wow. This has got to be the widest shoulder I've ever cycled on. It's about 10 meters across. <laughs> Woo! I got the whole shoulder to myself. Yeah! <laughs> Only 50 kilometers now. All right, so this is my campsite tonight here in Finland, and let's go over the stats. Can you see this? Okay, total distance today was 101 kilometers. Maximum speed, 41. Average speed, 20 something. Total time on the bike, just over five hours. So not bad, not bad at all. Today, however, was kind of boring, to be honest. Um, 101 kilometers went by pretty fast. It was dark, dark, raining a little bit, kind of on and off all day long, cold sometimes. And yeah, just lots of forest. Forest, 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 forest. That happens sometimes. Like, a lot of people imagine that like every day of a bike tour is gonna be a wild adventure, um, and it can be but sometimes you're just putting in the miles, you know, or in this case, the kilometers. So um, today was kind of just one of those days where I put my head down and pedaled, and it's kind of amazing how far you can go in a very short amount of time when you do that. So anyways, I am going to set up my camp now and crawl inside my tent. Okay. All right, so I've got camp all set up behind me. It just started raining, so the timing is like perfect. I'm going to climb inside the tent now, start making some dinner, and you guys sent me some questions you wanted me to answer on Instagram. So I have one question that was sent to me, and today I think it's appropriate to uh, answer that particular question. So hang tight. So I'm camped out in the forest, not too far from the road. Maybe I should have gone a little further because I can hear the road traffic quite a bit. While I'm here kind of preparing my dinner, I thought I would answer one of the questions that you guys sent to me on Instagram. I asked you a few days ago, some mosquitoes, to send in um, your best question, your number one question about bike touring or world travel or wild camping or whatever. And so I got a good question from Toto. 
and he says, or he or she, I'm not sure, he or she asks, culturally, what have been some of the real tough things to cope with when dealing with people from other parts of the world? And, and so I thought that was an interesting question. That's not something I get all the time, to be honest. Um, and my first response is like, oh, it's not, there's no difference really. Um, that's what I kind of thought. But then the more I thought about it, I was kind of thinking, actually, there's a whole bunch of things that are just different with other people from different parts of the world. But I'm not, like, I'm from the United States and I'm from California. But to be honest, like, people from New York are totally weird to me or people from Boston are totally weird to me, you know? So, like, or even people from another city in California can be totally weird to me. So I don't know if it's 100% like people from different countries are strange or different to me. It's just everyone is kind of different and strange to a certain extent. You know what I mean? Honestly though, like I think like one of the strangest or most difficult things to deal with when I'm traveling or meeting people from other cultures has to do with humor. Um, and just not getting other people's jokes or them not getting my jokes or that sort of a thing. Like, for example, I have like a very dry sense of humor. Like I can be very sarcastic. I can say something that I don't mean and say it with a completely straight face because I'm just joking, you know? But other people don't get that I'm joking because I say it with such a straight face. And I've had that trouble with some of my videos in the past where I've said something that I meant to be a joke, but everyone watching the video, or not everyone, but a lot of people from maybe other countries or something, did not understand that I was just being sarcastic. Um, and I think the best example that I can think of um, from my travels where this has happened is I was... It was my first like major bike tour in France and I had just cycled across Belgium and Luxembourg and crossed into northern France kind of near Met I was in Metz France which is between or like near the borders of Luxembourg and Germany and and I was staying with a bicycle touring pro reader uh, for the night she had invited me to come and stay at her home so I was like okay cool and so I, I went to her home met her super nice and she says hey like would you like to go out and meet some of my friends tonight like we're going to dinner or whatever do you want to come and i was like yeah that'd be great so we meet up later in the evening with this woman and her friends like th so her friends were three women and one other guy right and as th that group of four um, approached us the women started kissing the girl on both cheeks you know like they do in France right and um, and so like they're kissing her and then I'm thinking oh no they're gonna come over here and kiss me on both cheeks and I'm more of like a handshake kind of guy you know um, so anyways the the first woman she comes up and she go goes to give me a kiss on both cheeks and after she did that I jokingly said sarcastically said Oh boy, my first French kiss. <laughs> but I said it with like a complete straight face, you know? Oh boy, my first French kiss. And she immediately started jumping on me and kind of saying like, no, no, that wasn't a French kiss. Don't you know what a French kiss is? And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I know. I was just joking. I was just a, I was a joke. It was a joke. And, but she didn't think it was a joke. And she went on for the next three minutes trying to explain to me that like in France, people approach each other and they kiss on both cheeks and a French kiss, that's something totally different. And she was like trying to allude to what a French kiss was without actually saying what it was. And the whole time I was just like, I know what a French kiss is. I was joking, but she didn't understand that I was just making a joke. So that's probably, I think, the funniest and maybe the most interesting thing that um, I've run into just as far as coping with people from different parts of the world. So anyways, I'm going to make my dinner now. <laughs> Seriously, I'm making my dinner. Beans, 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 beans. At the end of my bike tour, I'm starting to go, woo. 
You know what I mean? Man, my eyes are all swollen again. Face. Hello, Darren Alf here from BicycleTrainPro.com. I am in the forest in Finland right now, and today is essentially the last day of cycling on my 25 day bike tour across Sweden, Norway, and Finland. For the last 25 days or so, I've been cycling on average about 85 kilometers per day. I started in Umia, Sweden, and I cycled north up to the North Cape in Northern Norway, and now I'm cycling back south, back towards Umia, Sweden. Now, Umia is about 555 kilometers or so away from where I am right now and I need to be there in two days and there's a reason for that I'll tell you later but um, I'm basically not going to be able to cycle 550 kilometers in two days so the plan today is to cycle just a short distance into town I think about 30 35 kilometers um, the nearest town here which is called like Romanami or something and I'm going to jump on a bus there hopefully and take that bus to the border of Finland and Sweden. Then I'll cycle across the border into, into Sweden, and tomorrow I will jump on another bus, which will then take me from whatever that town is called to Umia, Sweden, where I need to be. So that's the plan. This is essentially the final day on the road. I do have two more nights out in the woods, however, so I'm gonna pack up my stuff now. It's not gonna be the last time, but we're getting really, really close. All right, here we go. The weather has improved quite a bit since the last two days. It's still dark and cloudy, but it doesn't look like it will rain any moment. All right, here we are, back on the bike path leading into town. So it's just a short, I think 30, 35 kilometers to the bus station. I don't know what time the bus leaves though, so hopefully I didn't miss it. Howdy. on the outskirts of town now. I just gotta find my way into the center and find the main bus station. I'm going over a bridge, over the highway. This is by far the biggest city I've been in in quite some time. There's actually like a four lane highway. So I just got off the bus. Um, now I have to cycle about 20 kilometers west to the border of Sweden and Finland. So that's what I'm gonna do right now, 20 kilometers. All right, I made it. I'm at the border of Finland and Sweden right now. On the other side of the water there, is Sweden. So I've run into a bit of a problem. I'm at the bus station here in at the border of Sweden and Finland, Tornio and Harparasha, and uh, the bus station is completely closed. There's no one here, and tomorrow is the midsummer celebration here in Sweden and Finland. So it could be that all of the buses and like the whole town and everything is closed. And I had no idea, no idea whatsoever. So I had planned on getting on a bus tomorrow. There might not be a bus tomorrow. 
Um, I think that there's a bus from Umia coming in in like 20 minutes, however. And so I'm waiting here at the bus station, hoping that that bus will come in and I can ask the bus driver if the buses are running tomorrow. If they aren't, I am totally screwed. And I'm gonna be stuck in this town until like Monday, at probably the earliest. So, whoops, didn't plan that one. I've had such bad luck with public transportation in Sweden, I tell you. Anyways, um, I'm just waiting now for that bus to come in. Hopefully it does come in. I don't even know if it if it's running today, so. Oh dear. So I just spoke with one of the bus drivers and she said that the bus is running tomorrow. So hopefully she's right. And I have to come back here at like 10 o'clock tomorrow to get on that bus. So it's now after eight o'clock. I don't know where to stay. So I'm just gonna cycle out of town for a few kilometers dive into the forest, set up my tent, eat some food and call it a night. I had to cycle quite a ways out of town, about 25 minutes on the bike. Um, I'm probably, yeah, 10 kilometers out. And I just changed into my ski pants because there are mosquitoes just. Okay, so I came down this road. Um, on both sides of the road is like a swamp, total swamp. Water, mosquitoes, ant, ant farms and everything. So I'm gonna pitch my tent almost right in the middle of the road. I'm gonna set up the tent quickly because the mosquitoes are getting me. Okay, so this is by far the worst night of the entire trip when it comes to mosquitoes. There are just mosquitoes and these little uh, like noceums. You can't, they, they were biting me on the hands and you could barely feel them, but then you look down and you see these little black things biting you. And I think a bunch of them got inside the tent. I'm trying to slowly kill them. Um, one problem is I have a hole in my zipper. The zipper is not working in this tent anymore. I need to get a new tent. Um, and yeah, so that's not good. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just sprayed the entire tent with citronella oil. I have like a little tiny bottle of this citronella, like really strong. So that seems to have helped. There's been a brief exodus of the mosquitoes and noceums. I don't really see much of them anymore. But they were swarming here moments ago. Anyways, I got all of my panniers and stuff inside the tent because I didn't want to be opening the door and reaching in and out. So I got like everything inside the tent. Um, I went to the supermarket. I managed to get some bread, lettuce, cheese, cucumber, what else? Yeah, tomatoes. And that's about it. So I'm gonna make some sandwiches tonight and call it. Uh, I'm kind of glad that I didn't get anything that required the camp stove because uh, I'm just inside the tent and I want to stay inside the tent. I don't want to open that zipper. Hopefully I don't have to pee tonight. That's my main concern. So I'm gonna to try to stay in here for the rest of the night. It's about 9 p.m. at night right now. So stay in here if possible and then wake up early in the morning. I have to, the, there are three buses. One that leaves at like eight o'clock, one that leaves at 11 o'clock, and one that leaves at like 12.45 or something like that. So. I'm, I'm kind of aiming for that second one, but I, if I wake up early, I might just go and try to get on that first bus. So we'll see what happens, but here we are in the tent eating sandwiches, yeah! All right, so it's 6.50 in the morning. I just woke up. I'm gonna pack up my tent really quickly, bike 30 minutes back into town, go to the bus station, and try to get on the bus at 8.10. So I gotta move quickly.
cycling out of the center of Umeå now. I'm gonna try to find a place to camp just outside the city, maybe about 10, 15 kilometers outside of town. So I've cycled about 10 kilometers outside of town now. I'm gonna turn to the left here and go into the forest. Go. I was just letting those cars go past. This looks nice already. Um, I don't know where I'm going exactly, but uh, on my map, it shows that there's a cave back here. So I'm going to the cave just to check it out. Hopefully I can reach it. There might be a hiking trail only. Yeah. Well, I was hoping to go back here. There's supposed to be a cave or something. I'm gonna try biking. It looks like other people have ridden their bike down here. We'll see what happens. All right, this is pretty cool, huh? Um, there's a campfire pit right here. I would make a fire, but it's been raining for like a week. So everything is wet around here. Um, and I don't really have like, I don't know, lighter fluid or anything. Um, and then behind me here is the actual cave, I guess. I don't know where, if there is like actually a cave entrance, but on my map, it says cave entrance. So somewhere around here, I'm gonna have to climb around. Um, I think I'm going to set up my tent first, then I will explore the area. Once again, it doesn't get dark until super late, so um, I should be okay, just, I'm, I'm gonna camp right here, right by the fire pit, and then I'll explore the cave. I hope there's no bears in there, I really do. I hope there's no bears. I'm kind of uh, setting camp up quickly, because it's raining and there are mosquitoes. The one thing about this campsite that's good is it's, the wind is blowing a little bit, which is helping to keep the mosquitoes. The wind is kind of coming up this hill and hitting right into the tent. And that's exactly what I want tonight, is wind blowing across my tent. Um, and I'm not being sarcastic. I actually do want the wind tonight to keep the mosquitoes away. Okay, so my camp is set up. Now it's time to find this cave entrance. I have no idea where it is. I'm kind of just following the path that other people have created here. Um, that doesn't look right. This way. I bet you that most people in Umia who live here in town have never even been to this place. I'm, I would bet you money. Whoa, look at. People have camped way down there. That's awesome. And then look at the view over here. Yeah. Pretty spectacular, huh? That's nice.
Wow, this is really cool. I did not expect this. Um, I have no idea if there is an entrance anywhere. Shoot, mosquitoes are biting me. Um, but this place is really big. I thought it was just gonna be like a little crack in the rock or something. No, not the case. Oh man, the mosquitoes. Okay, I gotta go. They're getting me bad. Well, here's the cave. I'm a little afraid, <laughs> to be honest. I don't like going into these things by myself. <laughs> There's a geocache here. That's pretty much it. It doesn't, it doesn't go back any further. It's just this little area in here. All right, so I'm in the cave now. Um, it looks like yeah, some kind of registration book to just say that you've been here. I'll write my name, write Bicycle Touring Pro in here, and then I'll go back to the campsite. <laughs> Mosquitoes. All right, here we are, back at the campsite. I'm gonna jump inside the tent now, change my clothes, get some food. I don't know what time it is. I'm guessing it's a lot, about 7 p.m. or so. But yeah, this is a really cool camping spot. So it's the end of the day here. I'm inside my tent. You can hear probably that it's raining pretty good. Not super hard, but enough to fully saturate the tent for sure. Um, just hanging out inside my tent. I'm, I'm about to make uh, some sandwiches and then go to bed This is the last night that I will be in my tent Tomorrow I am checking into an apartment that I rented in the center of Umia, Sweden And I've rented this apartment for 40 days 40 days and nights um, And I'm going to use that time to work to relax to take a shower every day and um, wash my clothes, but mainly to work. Um, and I have some friends in town, so hopefully I'll see them as well. Um, what do I want to say at the end of a trip like this? Gosh, it's been fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Um, I took one shower in 25 days. What else? <laughs> Food was good. People were great. Scenery was spectacular. Um, it's gonna be hard to plan another bike tour after this because once you've had it this good, what do you go to next, you know? But there, the world is a big place and I haven't been everywhere. So still many, many places to explore. Um, I think one of the things that may be interesting and in pointing out at this point in my tour is that when I was 17 years old and I completed my first bike tour, or you know, when I was planning that first bike tour at least, I had these grand notions that uh, after I completed that first tour that like I was gonna come home from the trip and like the whole city was gonna be like having a parade for me or something you know my family would there would be there my friends like Miss America would be there to greet me with kiss on the cheek or something I don't know the mayor would give me a you know the key to the city there would be a marching band boop doo doo and yeah and uh, <laughs> I don't know, I had these wild ideas, you know, the, the newspapers would be out saying, Darren, you completed your bike tour down the California coastline. Tell me, how was it? You know, um, and all these crazy things. So <laughs> the reality is when I completed my first bike tour, three people were there, my mom, my sister, and my grandma to pick me up from the train station. And we went home and I took a shower and that was the end of it. So that's pretty much how all of my bike tours have kind of ended. I've never had a, a big party or a big celebration or even anybody waving me in and going, woo, good job or anything. My mom and dad maybe, that's about it. Um, but anyways, so this bike tour will be very much the same. I mean, I'm, I'm finishing tomorrow. I check into this apartment at 2 p.m. 
and after that I, I'm done you know I what I'm gonna wash my clothes straight away I'm gonna take a shower straight away I'm gonna get some food and then I'm gonna get to work you know so I don't know anyways that's kind of where my mind is at right now it's just like I've done this before I've been bike touring for 17 years all around the world um, this is the last day of many bike tours that I've done and uh, I'm glad to have completed the trip um, it was a it was a really good one um, and I would recommend this part of the world to anybody really uh, yeah so thanks so much for watching my adventure guys I really appreciate it once again I am Darren Alf from BicycleTurnPro.com. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you liked. I'd really appreciate it. And if you want to learn more about how to conduct your own bike tours, be sure to pick up a copy of my book, The Bicycle Touring Blueprint, which will teach you everything that you need to know about how to conduct your own bike tours anywhere in the world. Or check out my website at BicycleTouringPro.com. You can get the book there as well. All right, guys. That's it. Adios. Auf Wiedersehen. Dovizenia. And good night. morning I'm packing up my tent it's still raining sprinkling and there's mosquitoes biting me but uh, just got a couple more hours until I check into my apartment Well, this is it. This is the final stretch. I've only got two hours or so until I check into my apartment here in Umeå, Sweden. I get, just gotta get out of the forest, cycle about 15 kilometers back into the city center, and mosquito, and, uh, and then check into my place. I'm a little worried about checking in because I have to meet the people and I haven't taken a shower in two weeks, haven't washed my clothes in a month, and it's been raining, so I'm just like all wet and dirty. Anyways, here we go. <laughs> See ya. Ciao. Thanks again. Okay. Here I am now in my apartment in Umeå, Sweden. I've rented this place for 40 days and 40 nights. Let me give you a quick tour. So outside here, there is a little patio, which you can see here. And this is the view from the window. The patio is all enclosed because it gets quite cold here in the winter time. So um, anyways, that's the view. And then in here, is the living room and you can see there's some really nice flowers and stuff and over here is the TV more flowers in here is the bathroom which is not super exciting but there it is I just took a shower so and in here is the bedroom yeah. 
And in here is the kitchen. Nice little table to do some work at. Look at those flowers, those are really, that plant, it's not flowers, it's just a plant, but um, really, really spectacular color there. All right, so that's it for this trip, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed watching the trip as much as I enjoyed participating in it. Um, if you want to learn how to conduct your own bike tours, be sure to visit my website at BicycleTouringPro.com. Pick up a copy of my free Bicycle Touring Pro Starter Guide. And if you haven't done so already, and you're super serious about learning to conduct your own bike tours, be sure to pick up a copy of my book, The Bicycle Touring Blueprint, which will teach you everything you need to know about how to conduct a bike tour anywhere in the world, whether it's a two-day bike trip, a week-long bike trip, a month-long bike trip, or a bike trip that takes you all the way around the world. All right, that's it for this trip, guys. Thank you so much for watching. For the very last time, for this trip at least, I am Darren Alf from BicycleTurnPro.com, and I hope to see you guys out on the road sometime soon.